is Reason Revolution. I'm your host, Justin Clark. Thank you so much for joining us this week. This week brings you another interview. I'm so excited about having him on the on the show. Podcaster, ex-pastor, super cool guy extraordinaire, Luke King. How's it going, sir? Hey, it's great. Thanks for having me on the show, man. I'm really excited about this. Me too. I... Uh, uh, before we got started, I, we were talking a little bit before the show. And we talked about how we were trying to remember how we kind of discovered each other on Instagram. And you were telling me about how you guys did a little bit of a, of a Instagram follow blitz a little while back. And I, I was so impressed by kind of what I described as your your joyous nature. I thought that I liked the fact that you were, you were bringing, I think, a very positive um, perspective to, to atheism, which I think is sorely needed. I think it's, I think it's a good thing to sort of have that, that sense of happiness and, and, and sort of zest for life, which I think is, is extremely, um, uh, needed, I think at this juncture. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That was one of the things, um, you know, we might get into this later, but that was one of the things that I, I was uh, kind of deathly afraid of when I, lost or when I guess I let go of my faith was that I would just kind of, you know, be like, uh, nothing matters and just sit around and eat Cheetos and watch porn all day. And I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do that. So, so I, I mean, the visual of that's quite interesting. I mean, imagine <laughs> you would have one hand for the Cheetos, the other hand for, you know, yeah, um, I'm right handed. So you just got to make sure that you lick the right fingers. Exactly. The, yeah. the, the Cheeto dust <laughs> ear, uh, problem. Uh, could certainly be evaded that way, but, oh, <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you like many, many people, you know, I was describing a lot of really interesting folks in this atheist space, people like Jerry DeWitt, former Pentecostal preacher to an atheist or Bart Campolo, the son of, of Tony Campolo, the very famous evangelist is now the humanist chaplain out in California. You're one of those guys who used to be a part of the clergy you used to be a pastor, uh, and, you know, tell me about your upbringing. Tell me about how you got into the position of being a pastor and then kind of lead us through and how, what were the questions you were asking? And what were the things that you were kind of discovering that were sort of your way out? Because um, I think that's fascinating because I grew up pretty much secular. So I, I didn't have religion growing up as a, as a kid. So I'm always fascinated by how people get into religion and how they get out of it. Awesome. Dude, you're one of the lucky ones. Like I'm really jealous of people in your position <laughs> because, <laughs> because you, uh, you saw the light early or you never saw the light at all. Uh, my girlfriend, she was fortunate. She stopped believing when she was like 13. And unfortunately I didn't stop till I was 27. So I felt like I lost uh, quite a bit of time, but, uh, backing up, I grew up in Southern Michigan. So it's a very conservative, very religious part of the country. And I had a buddy of mine invite me to a uh, I, before this, I'd only gone to, I think, church a couple times. My uncle was a, is a pastor, and we went to his church like on Christmas and Easter, you know, the standard the standard days you go to church and check the box and put some money in the plate so that you don't feel guilty. And I went to a, uh, a an all-night youth group event with uh, a buddy of mine, and it was a the first thing was a hockey game. So we went, uh, we were sitting there and after the hockey game was over, this guy comes out and he says, uh, he starts preaching the gospel. And I, uh, I don't remember what he said. Um, the only, the only thing that I can tell you is that he was from a Baptist tradition. So my guess is that it was very, uh, hell directed. Um, it, it probably wasn't, uh, this joyous, uplifting message, like God has a plan for you and join the party. It was probably more like uh, there's eternal damnation waiting for you. So come over to this side because it's better. I can't say that with the firmest of recollections because I don't remember it. I just have a feeling that that's kind of the direction it was. And I remember uh, he was sharing whatever the gospel was that he was sharing. My heart started beating really fast. And I remember him saying, if your heart is beating really fast, that's Jesus talking to you. And it, as a seven or eight year old, it totally made sense to me. Uh, so I you know, figured that this was God speaking to me. I, at that point, you became a Christian, born again, got saved, you know, whichever moniker you decide to use for that, uh, for the, for that switch. And then I, I have... Uh, since I think I was born, I've been one of those people that's either all in or all out of whatever I'm a part of. So that even at that age, I remember going to church with my uncle 
and he started taking me to his church and I got really involved and got really into to the, the Bible. And I know that his message was very much uh, about uh, turn or burn kind of a deal was kind of his message. My parents didn't like that. So they pulled us out of that church. And then we all started going to ch church as a family at a United Methodist church. And I have nothing but positive experiences from my, my early childhood church years. I think from sixth grade all the way up to when I graduated, uh, it was great. I mean, it was, I, I loved it. We had such a, you know, we, it's, a, it's a farm community. So everybody knows everybody. Um, my dad broke his leg one year. He had a tree fall on him and he broke his leg. And the guys from the church came over and uh, put a new door on. And, you know, it was just a very, like, it was a great community. And I, like many others, I was at a church retreat in my high school years. And I felt that God was calling me to, full-time ministry. Uh, looking back on that now, I, I have a feeling that I, I wanted to be, I, I, I know growing up when people would come back from retreats and they would say God called them to full-time ministry, people thought that was awesome. And they were like, oh my gosh, that's so, you know, praise God. And, you know, they got a lot of accolades and stuff. And so I think I liked the attention. So I probably was like, awesome, God called me too. Uh, but I also just had this kind of resonant feeling that this was something I wanted to do. And I had always wanted to uh, additionally join the military. I was always drawn to that for some reason as a kid. Uh, I don't know if I liked the uniforms or if it was Top Gun or if it was watching Jag on CBS when uh, when that show was on and Catherine Bell was beautiful. And I was like, oh my gosh, who wouldn't want to be in uniform if this is what the women look like? And um, <laughs> and so so I, I basically uh, went to school at a, uh, a uh, called Spring Arbor University. It's a small free Methodist college in Michigan. And it was, it was a great experience for the most part. I mean, great community still to stay in touch with some of the guys, even though I'm in, you know, different, uh, different faith tradition these days, but really, you know, just kind of jumped in and, and found that this was, you know, I really still felt like this was what I wanted to do. And my undergraduate uh, my undergraduate life didn't really bring much questions. I didn't really have, th we did discuss some things in Bible classes about um, some you know, differences in the gospels and things like that, but it wasn't much. And this was also when I got really involved in the Pentecostal movement when I was there. So we had a charismatic professor who basically had us, you know, we were at, we were at these uh, Thursday night meetings, casting out demons from people and speaking in tongues and being slain in the spirit and all kinds of other great things. I had a demon cast out of me at one of those things. It was really oh, exciting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really bought into it. I mean, I was in man. Um, and we could, you know, if we want to get into all that thing, we could get into that. Yeah. Bit. That's actually an interesting kind of quick follow up because sure. I'm, I'm so intrigued by yes. Pentecostalism. I think it's such an interesting, um, and, in, and in my estimation, at least based on some of my research, a very quintessentially American strain of, of Christianity. There's something I think uniquely in some respects American about that. Maybe I'm wrong, but could you, I know you've, you've mentioned obviously speaking in tongues, casting out demons. Yeah. What else, what else about the Pentecostal tradition sort of made it different than say, you know, being a Baptist or a Methodist that's or a, whatever? That's a great question. I think the thing that sets Pentecostalism apart and the thing that drew me at the time was that it is more experiential than your traditional high church, mainline Protestant Catholic experiences. Um, when you are in a United Methodist church or when you're in a Catholic church or if you're in a mainline Protestant like Lutheran and stuff like that, uh, it's mainly a uh, heady, sing songs, read the Bible, pray, listen to sermon, and that's it. And the, the thing that really jumped out, I think that what the aspects that drew me to Pentecostalism were the aspects of a direct connection to God. So speaking in tongues to the Pentecost in the Pentecostal tradition, it, in, it, depending on which speaking in tongues you're talking about, is a is a direct line of communication between you and Jesus. It's like a secret secret language or like a secret handshake, uh, like what you have with your best friend. Uh, the idea of casting out demons, it, it's a it's a very um, 
kind of us versus uh, it's God versus the devil. So you're part of this epic struggle and who doesn't want to be part of an epic struggle, right? Who doesn't want to be, be a hero in a story. And so there's a draw to that where you are fighting the devil and you have the power of Jesus inside of you and you can go pray for someone. And that, that evil spirit that's inside of you will listen to you because you have the authority of Jesus. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's this, it's, you get, you wake up every morning and you're part of this, this battle between good and evil. And I think that's what drew me into that, uh, expression of christianity and it was be, was it because because it strikes me what i find interesting about it is that um you know at least here in the united states with different strains of christianity and obviously i'm going to be sort of generalizing here but but, sure. but it strikes me as there's sort of really among many things there's sort of these kind of two different factions there's sort of a more traditional reserved faction so people who tend to be like catholic or um or whatever where the faith is very uh it's very contained it's very constrained it's, it's right. there's there is a real sense of its history and there's a real sense of its of its gra uh, the gravity of it and then there's this other side of it which is i think fascinating which is that sort of throws off those shackles and is a very active sort of participatory type of religion and it strikes me that pentecostalism is something that's that i think is akin to that you're, you're absolutely right and and the the fun part too when I was in college, we met people who were, you know, we met a couple of charismatic priests who are Catholic priests who firmly believed in speaking in tongues and praying and praying for healing and all those kinds of things. And uh, so there was, uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, there, there is a, there's essentially kind of the, the stale old way and the new exciting way. It was virtually how we looked at it. Um, I think during those times. It's interesting. So, so you, you've gone to undergrad, you're getting in, in the middle of this sort of Pentecostal movement. And, um, and so, uh, when did you graduate and, and did, was your degree in, in, in sort of liberal studies? Was it, was it theology? What was your, your, um, degree in? I graduated in 2007 with a bachelor's in philosophy and religion. And I started, then I moved out to California and started my Master of Divinity at Azusa Pacific. My goal, the initial goal was to go to Zambia to be a missionary. Uh, when I graduated from college, I went to, I went on a cross-cultural experience in Zambia. I was there for 21 days and we got to stay with nationals and meet some really great people. And interestingly enough, the, the, the mainline churches there, the Wesleyan churches and the Methodist churches, they look very much like a Pentecostal church over there. Oh, okay. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of speaking in tongues. There's a lot of praying for healing. There's a lot of casting out demons uh, within those uh, traditionally more stale traditions here in the U.S. Uh, and, and I can't speak for the Catholic tradition. I, I didn't go to a Catholic church when I was there, so I can't speak to that. But I can. You know, I went to a Wesleyan church that looked exactly like a Pentecostal church here. I went to several different churches that had uh, Methodists attached to them or, you know, Baptists attached to them that were very much like a Pentecostal jump up and down, speak in tongues, cast out demons kind of experience. And so when I when I moved to California, that's what I wanted to do was to go over to that. Then I got married and uh, we got married. I pivoted a little bit to go back to, I wanted to then pursue the chaplaincy in the Navy. That was something that is always drawn. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I called the Navy recruiter when I was 16 years old to find out what I needed to do when I was a chaplain or to oh, be wow. a chaplain. So I, I started to, to move in that direction again. And it was really exciting. I was really loving what I was doing at the same time. I was going through, uh, I was, a uh, my marriage was not good. And I was going to counseling. I'd spent, I was uh, spent about two years in counseling up to where, I, when I got my divorce and uh, I was, when I was in seminary, we had a, a pastoral counseling class. And when I was in that class, all of a sudden I started learning about 
what it means to actually be an adult and take responsibility for your actions and take responsibility for your emotions and be responsible, uh, see other people as equals and peers and not just see yourself as this one down person all the time. Cause this is really how I lived my life was just, uh, whenever I had doubts, I would be like, well, my pastor believes it and he's more educated than I am. Or, well, my professor believes it and he's more educated than I am. Uh, or my pastor told me to do this. And because he's the pastor, I need to do that. And I can't push back on that. And I started to, you know, I essentially experienced my teenage rebellion when I was 27. Um, I see. Yeah. When, when, when most people, when most, when most people rebel against their parents, it just took me like a decade later uh, to do that. And, and I, and all of a sudden I was open to this whole new world of freedom where I could like be in charge of my own life. And and the thing that was holding me back from all of that was religion. Uh, I didn't realize that at the time. I just thought I was like being like, yeah, fuck it all. Um, sorry, can you say that on the show? I forget. You're if you good to go, the, sir. If you have the E on that or not. Um, You're good and, to go. Uh, and so I, uh, I didn't realize at the time, the only thing was I realized I was in a bad marriage uh, and I wanted to get out. And it wasn't bad in terms of like, I was, you know, no, there was no abuse or anything like that. It was, uh, I was with a woman that, that, you know, I grew a lot in terms of recognizing my needs and my desires and all that. And I was with someone who just wasn't there uh, and wasn't a capable of giving me what I felt I needed in a relationship. So when I left, when I decided to get divorced, that was when shit hit the fan. Um, I see. Yeah, that was. So why it was, I mean, obviously there's the toll of, you know, having a long-term relationship end, but what else was characteristic of, of when this sort of turmoil hit you? Um, you mean in terms of like, uh, like the, the faith, the faith doubting? Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. just in general. I mean, so, or, I mean, I guess, uh, I guess in another way is, you know, how did the shit hit the fan? <laughs> well, when I told my wife that I was leaving, um, I also told my pastor that I was leaving and he wanted to talk to me because here's the thing. Um, you need to keep up the facade when you're in the church that everything's okay. And then when everything's not okay, and when you tell people it's not okay, everybody thinks they can come in and that they have the answer that's going to keep you from making a decision that they don't think you should make. And uh, so every, every Christian that I knew to the rescue uh, when things started to hit the fan, but I'd already made my decision at this time that I was going to, to leave, uh, leave the marriage. So my pastor, uh, wanted to, me to meet with him. So I met with him and I told him why I was leaving. And he looked at me straight in the eyes. I'll never forget this moment in Starbucks in Laverne, California. He looked me straight in the eyes and he said, well, it's just as I thought. You're smug, full of pride, self-deceived, and it's tragic. And he stood up and he gave me a hug and he walked out the door. Um, that was it. That was, the, that was, there was no, there was no attempt to understand. Um, and I think it's probably because it pressed his own buttons in terms of, um, you know, insecurities that he felt, but that's for another day. And then he proceeded to hold meetings about me, uh, you know, all kinds of just really great pastoral things uh, took place during that. Uh, he took it upon himself to contact my endorser for the Navy and tell him what was going on before I had a chance to do that. And I was really, the first thing that really caused me turmoil was all of these Christ-like people treating me like shit, um, I think was, was point number one, was just like all of these people that, that claimed unconditional love, uh, there's a condition on it. And the condition is if you violate the tenets of the institution, you're no longer worthy of love. That's so, uh, that's so sad. It is. It, it's, it is sad. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and I tell people all the time that I know who are in church, uh, the church, you know, I could walk into any church today. In fact, I could guarantee you, Justin, if I walked into that very church that kicked me out with a new pastor and I told my story without any of them knowing who I was, they would say, we would never do that. We would welcome you here with open arms. I guarantee you they would say that uh, because the church does a really good job of of cleaning you up as long as you've crawled through the shit already. Yeah. But what, and they also do, I think, a terrific job of being able to sort of have this weird sort of cognitive dissonance where they're constantly able to tell you, oh, we're like this and we represent this, when in reality they sort of do other things that are not so great. But then they never actually have to take responsibility for the for the sort of lesser angels of their institution. And right. that's and that's really what I think has always frustrated me about organized religion as an outsider, is that it's, you know, 
it's a deeply political uh, institution and one where it's much like with like a party, a political party or, or a, a, a position of government where if you don't ta- sort of toe the party line ever so slightly, if you if you deviate from the mold in any way that sort of harms the institution, they are more than happy to throw you under the bus because in their instant, because they're thinking on the subject is I have the will of God behind me. What do you exactly. have? Exactly. Exactly. And, and that was where, that was when, that was when things started to crack, I think, but I still wasn't, I still wasn't trying to leave the faith at this point. I actually tried to uh, seek out religious guidance from other pastors who might be more open to my situation. I actually found a couple, Um, but then I also started practicing yoga. And when I started practicing yoga, I met Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus and people from different faiths and non-religious folks who were living wonderful, fulfilled, happy lives without Jesus. And when you've been part of the Christian tradition from essentially, uh, you know, birth until 27, you're told by everyone that you need Jesus to have a fulfilled life. And now here I am meeting all these people who are living wonderful, fulfilled lives, who are more Christ-like than the folks who claim to follow uh, Jesus. And and I was like, well, why in the hell do I need any of this stuff? Um, and the big, the big thing was that now my income no longer depended on what I believed. So when you're a pastor, you can doubt all you want, but you have to arrive at a position of belief at the end of the day or else you don't get paid. And now all these doubts that I'd pushed back, all these doubts that I was like, ah, I don't, you know, I won't worry about these because my professors don't care. So I won't, I, it doesn't matter to me. Um, all of those doubts I was now able to address and assess without the, without my livelihood being at stake. And that totally changed the way I approached faith, the way I approached the Bible, the way I approached life um, was just like, wow, I can actually like really evaluate this stuff and come to whatever conclusion I come to. That was something in my life that was was very rewarding was, um, you know, the the moment you sort of realize on some level that your life belongs to you, that you're, you know, you're not owned by the state, you're not owned by the church, you're not owned by, you know, to even to a certain extent, your family, that you get to, your life belongs to you. And that was something that I discovered when I sort of, sort of left my my notions of wanting to be religious behind me. And, and like I, I think I mentioned before, you know, I grew up pretty much secular. My parents were non-religious, but there was something both incredibly gratifying and freeing about the moment of saying, you know, I think I'm really done with this idea that uh, that I have to sort of placate to other people's interests and that I, you know, I need to genuinely start caring about my own life and my own needs rather than just constantly trying to fulfill some social function, which I'd, I shouldn't even have to really care about anyway. So that's one of the beauties of, of in my opinion, at least of when I became an atheist, I became an atheist at 19 um, of just going like, oh, wow, like this is my shot now. This is my life now. I get to make my decisions and I get to live with the results of the decisions, good or bad. But the fact that it belongs to me was something incredibly gratifying and freeing. And and I imagine from what I'm hearing, it was very similar in some respects for you. One of the most difficult moments of my life experience was when I realized that the only common denominator in every one of my life experiences was me. And one of the most freeing moments of my life was when I realized that the only common denominator in all of my life experience was me. I mean, when you realize you're the problem, then you realize you're the solution. And, and that, that was, that was how I felt when it came to dating. That was how I felt when it comes to finances. That's how I felt when it comes to, you know, 100% of, of where I am today. Uh, I can take responsibility for, not necessarily blame, but I can take responsibility for where I am and I can move forward. And that was something that was like incredibly freeing, although it does take a hit to your ego when you realize, oh my gosh, I've dated like 14 women and it's all sucked. And the reason it's all, and and like the only thing that all these women had in common was me. 
Um, so that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, you know, that's a, <laughs> it's a very sobering moment. Well, what do you do? Um, but, but then it's at the same time, it's like, well, if, if I'm the problem, then I'm the solution. And that's a freeing thing because the only person that you really can change, um, you know, unless you're, uh, what you were talking about, uh, uh, was a couple of weeks ago about determinism or something like that. You mm-hmm. know, if you, if you think you can actually change, um, you, you can change yourself and, and that's, um, you know, you can take responsibility for that. So it was really freeing. Um, it's, it's been a, it was a really freeing experience for me. Yeah. It, it's, it's, I find it to be one of those, uh, you know, I always describe it to people. I say, you know, that you, there's that great quote and it's, it's often attributed to either to Sun Tzu or somebody else. I think maybe Epicurus, it's like you have two lives. The second one begins when you realize you only have one. Yeah. And yeah. And to me, that was kind of how it was, you know, up until sort of my my sort of intellectual flourishing in college, I lived a very passive life. You know, I had things that I loved, I was really interested in and that I cared about. But but, you know, I was a decent student. I could have been better, but but I was lazy. I wanted to, you know, I I, at the time I wanted to go into music. I was a musician. So that was what I was going to do. And and then that sort of didn't pan out. And I realized, okay, well, what's the other thing that I really like? And the other thing I really always loved was history and 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 social studies and in high school and and the one of the big moments that there were really two moments of my life that really shaped who i've become one of them was um i worked for uh president barack obama's first presidential campaign i i was 18 uh 17 going on 18 when i started working on the campaign uh here in indiana i was what they awesome. called him i uh, thanks uh i was what they called a rural captain i was somebody who who um went around the county and talked to rural voters people who were farmers people who were yeah. who were uh you know regular working class folks and telling them about sort of what Obama wanted to do for people like them and 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 sort of the notions of uh, this was my early sense of understanding sort of econ- economic and social justice and and working for his campaign gave me something sort of bigger that I really wanted in my life that was really kind of in, in, invigorating and special um, that then end up, ended up becoming my um, senior project. And what was really cool about that was that when you were done with your senior project, I mean, obviously he won, which was great. Right. Um, that, that helped the senior project. He also won the state of Indiana, which made which made the project even better. Um, was you know I went to a rural high school. My graduating class was like two hundred. Um, oh, nice. Mine was one hundred and sixteen. Yeah, one hundred sixteen. <laughs> Actually, no, I overshot it. You you know you I overshot it. It wasn't two hundred. It was like one hundred and twenty. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you knew everybody. I knew everybody, you know, and, 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 you know, it was the kind of school where it was like drive your tractor to work day and drive your tractor to school day rather. But it was really fun to like live in this very, you know, I mean, by all accounts, I mean, very conservative area of the country and to have this big, huge red, white, and blue trifold with my project on it and this giant poster of Obama in the middle of it and just watching the rednecks get angry. It was, Oh yeah. Oh, for an 18 year old political punk rocker like me, that was, mm, that was awesome. Dude, that is like, that is the, uh, that is rebellion in a nutshell right there. Yeah, exactly. That's a caricature of rebellion, especially back there. For me, absolutely. You know, for some kids, their rebellion was like, you know, getting high or, or, you know, uh, getting drunk or, or partying or whatever. My version of rebellion was working for a presidential candidate campaign and to see it through to its end, which, which really meant the world to me. And then the other thing that really happened was, uh, you know, um, I get in college 2009, I start reading a lot of interesting things and sort of discover atheism and kind of what atheism is because i always felt sort of non-religious and so i started reading some different things and then i by the fall of 2009 i was like yeah i don't believe in this anymore i i I don't buy into this stuff anymore and i didn't really much to begin with but there was something that really kind of happened that was great was i had worked in that campaign and it really gave me something like okay i have something i can work for but then now that that I, i sort of let but left behind any sort of religious inclinations, I sort of got this new lease on life of like, wait, so this life is really mine and I can do with it as best as I can. And so that was really when I became a much more uh, dedicated student. And and then from there, it was just, it was history. And and, and so I, you know, I, I found that, you know, you know, in order for me to find my humanism, 
I had to find my atheism first. And it sounds like in some respects, that's what happened with you. Absolutely. I, yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, that's, um, everything is filtered through the lens of religion when you are, when you are a pastor and you can't embrace your humanity. You can't embrace who you are. You can't embrace your connection with everything around you. It, it's all has to go through God. You have to, it's gotta be God's plan, God's will, God, what God wants you to do. And I remember when I was first, once I left the church and I hadn't written my certificate of divorce yet from the church, I actually wrote a, uh, uh, there was a day that I was like, no, if I'm going to do this, like I need to make a decision that I'm not going to, that I'm going to, I'm going to consciously reject my faith. Um, and I, I haven't gotten struck by lightning yet, uh, because of that. And that was a few years ago. So I think I'm okay, <laughs> but I was inspired to do that by someone I had met who said that she did the very same thing in her life was incredible. She was, you know, she's studying she's a PhD. I mean, just everything was great. And because you're taught again, going back to, it was taught as a Christian that you, your life will be a failure if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in Jesus. I mean, that's the gist of the Christian argument. And I hear, I meet someone who's living life just incredibly. And I was like, shoot, I can do that too. So that's when I kind of wrote my certificate of divorce from the church. But I was, uh, uh, some, uh, some I was dating asked me, well, what do you want to do? in life. And I'd never been asked that question. I'd never been able to answer that question because it was always, what did God want you to do in life? That was the whole metric on how I lived. So that was, a, th that opened up another whole, you know, whole can of worms, which kind of gets us to where I am today. But, um, but that's, I mean, that's, man, that's a, that's a real short pared down version of, of how I got <laughs> to like, you know, and I mean, people, you know, I mean, the listeners, sorry. I mean, that it really logistically is like a short version of it. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Um, let's, let's take just a little step back and unpack it sure. a little. So, you know, obviously you had a lot of, sort of uh things happening in your personal life that sort of sort of reconfigured where your agency was going to be yes and, and, and you know but in terms of once okay so you you get divorced you 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 leave the church you and now you're sort of rebuilding your life yeah so how do you how does one go from being sort of former pastor to now being this sort of um, you know, podcaster, content creator, and, and in many respects, very public. I will, let, I, will, I will let you know, uh, in, in a few years. <laughs> um, um, so man, that's the question right there. I mean, that is the, that's the, the million dollar question, or in this case, maybe 45 to $50,000 question, you know, is a decent, <laughs> a decent salary. Uh, I, I, Never, when I, when I got rid of the faith and I left that and uh, what I found when I became an atheist, was a lot of great things out there about why you should give up your faith and why faith is wrong. So if you want to read, if, if you want to, you know, find some great arguments against God, they're everywhere. If you want to hear someone talk about why you shouldn't believe in God, they are everywhere. But as someone who built an entire life around faith, who's someone who spent 27 years in a worldview to have that worldview pulled out from underneath me. And it wasn't pulled out. Like somebody didn't do that to me. Like I gave it up, mm -hmm. but to have that worldview gone, I mean, my social calendar was based around this. My friendships were based around this. My worldview was based around this. My reason for waking up in the morning was was built around this. My my uh, m m the way I viewed family was built around this. Who I wanted to marry, whether I wanted to marry, did I want to have kids? All of this was related and connected to Christianity. My whole life was there, and what I didn't find was anything for somebody who goes, the fuck do I do now? I, I, <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find that. And, and my fear was that I was going to wake up in the morning and have no purpose whatsoever. I was going to wake up in the morning and, and, and not know what to do. And I worked in a couple of factories when I was uh, in, in high school during the summer, and I was surrounded by people who hated life. They got up every month that, you know, they, they looked forward to Friday. And then as soon as Friday at five quit, they were already dreading going to work on Monday morning. 
And I've never wanted to live that life. And a lot of the, listen, there are a bunch of smart, wonderful, loving atheists out there. There are also a lot of angry, bitter, completely intellectual, non-feeling, uh, unemotional atheists out there. And I, f I found I was hearing a lot of those voices, but I wasn't hearing a lot of people saying, um, you know, here's, a, here's, here's a nice way to build a secular worldview. And the, the reality of the situation is, you know, uh, call me weak, call me emotional, call me crazy. I feel like uh, if I were to, we all need in some cases a paradigm or a shortcut or some kind of worldview that, uh, you know, that, that tells you how to function or it helps you function. Because if you have to uh, pair and pour over every decision you make all day of your life, it's going to be really frustrating. And I never lost my drive to be a pastor. I love walking through life with people. It's like my favorite thing to do. I love it when someone comes to me and says, I have a dream to do this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? Tell me all about it. Or someone says, uh, you know, hey, I, uh, I, I'm engaged, but I went and, I don't know, slept with a couple of people that I met off of Craigslist. And I can be like, okay, you know, you did a, you know, you did a thing maybe you shouldn't do. Can, let's find out what, like, what drove you to that? Um, what is it about the relationship that you're in that made you feel like what you just did was like healthy and okay? And I never lost that. But there was no, it doesn't seem like, like, a, like a place for that. There doesn't seem like there's a, there didn't seem like at any point there was, there was something for that. So I was like, well, shit, I just might as well do it then. Um, and I love to talk. I mean, clearly anybody who's listened this far knows that I have no problem saying words. And, <laughs> and it's, it's something I've, I've always loved to do. I love talking to people. Uh, if they don't listen to me, I don't mind talking at them. And, and so it's, uh, it was one of those things of, of this, I don't feel like there's this, I don't feel like this is happening. So let me do this. And uh, one day I was like, your atheist pastor sounds like a really funny, th funny way to phrase it. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of how it started. I mean, I basically started because I needed, I, I feel like, I feel like this started very selfishly. It started because I needed an outlet because I was pissed at the church. And because I kind of wanted to give a big fuck you to everybody that turned their back on me and said, I would regret this decision because I don't regret the decision. I don't regret leaving my marriage. I don't regret leaving my faith. I don't regret any of it. And, and it started as kind of this colossal double middle finger to, to everybody that was a douche during my divorce. And it's transformed into this really fun community where um, the anger for the most part has subsided. And now it's just about living life and trying to enjoy the really short time we have on it. I love that. I, I really love that. And, and you and I are sort of, in my opinion, co-travelers in this walk through life in, in a lot of ways. I, I feel the same way um, about sort of, I think some of the issues regarding the atheist community. I mean, so you, you, I mean, obviously, you know, atheism as a as a as a worldview or as a as a position on a, on 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 God or whatever is as old as religion itself. But but these days, I mean, the public face of atheism has a very um, not to say negative tone, but it does have a very strident tone. Which it does. And 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 I've always believed deeply that. Um, that uh, this movement needs both firebrands and diplomats. Yeah, and, I like and, that. E and even though my show is called Reason Revolution, you'd assume I'd be more of a firebrand, but I'm not. I'm actually more of a diplomat. But what I, the reason I named my show the way I did was that I, you know, I very much believe in this idea that life must be guided by philosophy, a philosophy of some sort. It's very easy to for, for you to tell people what you don't believe in. Sure. It's much, it's much harder to tell them what you do believe in. Um, and even though, you know, you and I no longer believe in God or gods or superstition, there's much that we do believe in and there's much that we do value. And there's much that we do want to sort of see um, flourish in the culture. And so, you know, I describe my stuff as being a revolution of ideas that we sort of move away from superstition and irrationality and sort of tribalism and we move towards sort of reason and critical thinking and humanism and and so you know i very much value this this sort of 
newer generation of atheists that are coming up, you know, that are, that are not Christopher Hitchens, they're not Sam Harris, they're not David Silverman. They're, they're really creating a voice all their own. And, 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 and that was what intrigued me. That's why I wanted to speak with you. So, you know, I guess that's my sort of C-SPAN caller way of getting to my question. <laughs> so, you know, so tell me a little bit about the inception of your atheist pastor and sort of where it is now in sort of its development. Well, where it is now, oh my gosh, what a, what an appropriate time to ask because it's uh, it's, it's evolving and it's, it's, we're really changing the focus this year. Um, it was all about uh, pretty much it was all about me and my opinions last year and the first few ones and now we're really making it all about the people that are listening which is a really great strategy uh to to keep people listening um but i mean, I mean and i say that kind of tongue in cheek in a way um cuz people listen cuz people you know people listen to your show justin cuz they like what you have to say and people listen to anybody or they hate it and they want to you know my thing is whether my thing is i don't care whether you love what i say or whether you hate what i say i just care that you hear what i say I feel um, the same way. You know, I don't care if you love it or hate it. Just listen, because that's you know, that's what's ultimately the goal. And and I I wanted to do this, you know, even if you're listening and you disagree with everything I say, at least it gives you something, you know, to to go off of. It's it's one thing to say I don't know what I believe. It's another thing to go I'm not sure what I believe, but I don't believe that. And here's why. And, and so it gives someone a, a chance to, to go. So what, where we're at now is we want to, basically, we want to be a, a community that, we want to be a place for secular people and atheists to find love, belonging, and connection. That's it. And that's, that's the, that's the goal. That is what is, that is what is, it goes through every fiber of what we do from the beginning of the show to the interviews, to even when we talk about uh, religion in the news, we, we want everything to be about a place for secular people to find love, belonging and connection. Cause the atheist community does so many things, right? The problem is the atheist community, isn't that great at community? And part of it goes back to what you were saying earlier it's really hard to get, if you've got a group of a hundred people who are atheists in a room, there's a good chance you have 100 unique, incredibly different personalities because the only way, sometimes the only way that atheists find commonalities is in what we don't believe in. That's true. So, I, I describe the movement as, as a, as a large movement of very opinionated, but uncontrollable cats. <laughs> and that's so, that's exactly what it is. So what we want to do is take all of those, Un uh, uncontrollable cats and say this is a place that you belong whether you're you know no matter what and, and especially because um we've been doing uh we kind of started doing uh, these weekly live streams which have really turned into some really exciting interesting uh, experiences and somebody reached out to us the other day and said you guys are the only people that i have that i can talk to about this um and that just like that hit tammy and i like with goosebumps because you know, for that person, we are their only atheist outlet. Like they can't talk to their parents. They can't talk to their friends. Uh, they're in a very religious scenario and there's only one, there's only two people they, they feel like they can talk to. And that, that, that hit us, uh, right in the heart because at the end of the day, we all want to belong. We all want to feel like we're worthy. We all want to feel like someone loves us. Doesn't need to be a lot of people. Um, but, but you know, no human being should walk through life thinking that they're bad. And we, we want, we want to make sure that no matter who you are or where you are or what you, or where you've been, um, you know, we want to know, we want you to know you belong with us. And right now it's an online community because, you know, we're kind of scattered across the country and, uh, but we do, uh, we're trying to do more, you know, meetup type stuff and, and more of the hangouts, but it's really about. Uh, we want, so what we want to do this year is uh, have a little bit more shared experience in terms of, you know, reading books together and, and having like a, a your atheist uh, book club. And we want to uh, interview folks who are doing atheist community. So this week we've got an interview with Ali Kellogg, who's the chapter head of the satanic temple of Los Angeles. 
And it was a great interview with her. And we want to try to find places that all of this, you know, this group of secular folks that we have, um, we want them to have, we want to be a resource for them to know, oh, this is a cool little thing we can go check out if this fits our paradigm, if this fits our worldview. Um, this, the Satanic Temple, they tend to be fairly rebellious. So if you happen to be a rebellious uh, fo- person, the Satanic Temple is probably a great place for you to go. That's so cool. Um, one person, if you haven't had them on your show yet, who I think would be excellent for you is um, Justin Scott, who is the the founder and director of Eastern Iowa Atheists. He's Ooh. he's an unbelievably cool guy. He was my very first interview on this show. Um, we had so much fun talking. We ended up doing a four hour conversation, which I had to split wow. up into two shows. I had to split it into two shows because he is one of those guys, you know, and I think I've said this on the show before, but um, in the atheist movement, uh, I think a lot of people sort of fall into largely two camps. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big picture guy, so I tend to do this kind of thing. So they're sort of, I think I call them, I call them thought leaders and foot soldiers. Um, thought leaders are people like me. Uh, I'm not somebody who tends to do a lot of protesting. Um, I don't tend to do a lot of like in-person stuff. My real main thing that I do is my show and what I write. And I've done a public, I've done a couple, um, public appearances in terms of lectures. I've done a public debate with a Christian, things like that, but I'm far more interested in sort of the ideas of atheism and free thought and humanism and finding ways to sort of find, uh, to propagate them and to make them accessible for people so that they can then use what they learn from, from what we're trying to develop it through content and sort of put that into practice. And, and Justin Scott is one of those guys. He is, I think, one of the most dedicated foot soldiers for atheism the country has. He's terrific. Um, and he is, he's a guy who, you know, he writes letters to the newspaper. He, um, he goes to city council meetings and he gives humanist invocations when they still do prayers. And he, and he openly like criticizes local elected officials for being theocratic and, and he's done protests and he's done all kinds of great things. He is terrific. He's one of those guys who is trying to sort of um, be a, a on the ground grassroots activist who really puts into practice the ideas um, that you know honestly lazier folks like myself don't always do. So it's it's um, so he's a really cool guy. I, I suggest reaching out to him. Absolutely, will I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the the plug, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna drop your name when I uh, when I email him or call him. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, no, I think that's, um, man. And that's, you know, the thing is that there are a, to, to borrow, uh, because the church, the church can steal and borrow from anybody that they like. So I like to borrow this terminology from the church. Like there are a lot of atheist evangelists out there. I mean, there are, there are people who are out there on these kind of atheist crusades where they're out there, you know, talking about the ideas and, and talking about and making them accessible. And that's the beautiful thing about it. When people can explain stuff that most people don't get, um, that helps to move towards atheism. I know it helped me and I loved that about it. The thing I found missing was the community aspect of it. And I, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it sounds simple and trendy and whatever, but it's just kind of, it's my thing. I mean, I love, I love hanging out with people. That's my, that's, I love it. And it's, um, you know, we have, you know, we have dreams of one of these days having, you know, all kinds of places that atheists can go to gather and, and just hang out. And I'd love to have a bar in that building. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, but it's a weird thing because we don't unite among these, these, this common principle thing. I mean, you've got atheist vegans, you've got atheist meat eaters, you've got atheist <laughs> conservatives, atheist liberals. I mean, they're all, the, the whole spectrum is represented. For sure. And, and that's always, I think, one of the challenges that the movement has is that there's always been a certain level of, um, of infighting, that, 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 that there's been, you know, very public infighting where um, uh, people who, you know, I, I broadly call it sort of the atheist left and the atheist right. And, and you know, if you think of somebody like uh, the very recent uh, 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 Skepticon, and the recent sort of dust up between Thomas Smith 
and Sargon of Akkad, Carl Benjamin, and how, you know, and I don't know if you follow this story or not. I haven't, but I'm really intrigued. So go on. So, so um, Thomas Smith is a very sort of left-leaning progressive atheist podcaster. He, he does a show, I think called serious inquiries only, and he's very much interested in sort of social justice and things like that. And so he sort of fits in what I call the atheist left. And then there's Carl Benjamin known as Sargon of Akkad. He's a very popular YouTube host and political pundit who is an atheist, but that's not really what he spends most of his time on. He's, he's very much on the political right. Um, just, you know, even though he sort of describes himself as being a classical liberal, he's one of those guys who sort of, you know, there's not a better way of saying this. It's a little trendy or whatever, but he's sort of what you would call an anti SJW. Got it. And so at Skepticon this year, uh, they not Skepticon. I'm sorry. It, Mythcon, not Skepticon. Sorry. Skepticon's wonderful. They're great. Mythcon was a shit show. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> so Mythcon, when Mythcon happened up in Milwaukee, uh, Thomas Smith, and originally, I think originally what they wanted to do was they originally had, I think Dave Rubin, who's a talk show host on YouTube. Yep who's going to host um uh uh the the thing and i don't know if you've how much you've listened to my show but i'm a very vocal critic of dave rubin i think he's kind of a scumbag um and i think he's somebody who who i think sort of turned his back on on a lot of the core of his audience in the attempt to sort of get patreon money and that's just kind yeah. of my, my take but anyway so long story short uh he backs out or somebody backs out and they bring in thomas smith to sort of be the sort of the vocal opposition right and instead of having sort of this healthy exchange of ideas, which, you know, I think is, is healthy. I mean, I, you know, I don't think any ideas are really sacred. I think it's, it's good to have an open exchange of ideas, but what really ended up happening was an absolute disaster where, uh, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Smith kind of lost his shit and, and, and Carl looked kind of like an asshole. And, and, and keep in mind, by the way, that like the vast majority of the people in the room were not there for the entire conference. The mass, vast majority of them were there to see Sargon of Akkad. And the vast majority of those people who sort of came in, who were not a part of this conference as a whole, but came for this talk, they were Christians. And a lot of them were a part of the, the sort of the broader tent of the sort of extreme right or the alt right or oh, Trump supporters. Exciting. And so these are the kind of people who sort of throw up like sort of white nationalist symbols and all this kind of stuff. So it became a very public mess um, and made the atheism movement look really bad. Uh, I, I think it, it, it really damaged the reputation of public atheism because um, it, it, you know, Thomas, I think, admittedly said, you know, I didn't really I didn't really present myself as best as I could, but I was very emotional about the situation because, I mean, I, 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 I would be equally emotional. I think that Carl Benjamin is, um, I think he's both occasionally uh, racist uh, and bigoted um, and it is certainly inflammatory and, and certainly not the kind of voice that is worthwhile to always listen to, even though I'm for an open exchange of ideas. But it, it became one of these things where it was that perennial question of what does it mean to have a community? Who is included in that community? Who should, should we exclude people? If we are going to exclude people, who do we exclude? What is this whole, you know, and then it gets into issues of sort of freedom of expression and freedom of speech and things like that. And so, you know, one thing I'm worried about, and I think it's, I think one of the things that you're doing, which I think is quite good, is that you're sort of saying, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of darkness to, to any kind of social movement that sort of seeks to, to assert itself. There's always a, a hint of its darkness, but what we should seek to do is to build something a little bit better. And, and, and I appreciate that. And I think it's, I think it's needed. Well, and you know, I mean, here's the thing. It's a, it's the most naive thing ever to, to hope that you can do something like that. And, and especially in today's day and age, I mean, I'm kind of the, the quintessential greater fool when it comes to, when it comes to thinking that we can, we can actually do this. Um, because you're, you're exactly right. The, the, the infighting and the arguing and the bickering. And, and part of it is that, that atheists, when you, when you have a Christian troll 
they know how to push your buttons, man, like nobody's business. I mean, they just <laughs> get it. Like yeah. they know how to do it. And as level headed as as reasonable as I want to be, like these a holes come in here and say something like, prove the Bible. Prove to me that the Bible doesn't prove that God is real. And it's like it's like dangling a stake in front of a starving dog. I mean, you just can't mm -hmm. you just can't help yourself. And I told I mean, I and I got into this guy and eventually I just wanted to be like, fuck you, motherfucker. Like I just oh, I was so frustrated. And they know how to do it. And the thing is, is that we take the bait so often. I this is the collective we. Um, like we take the bait so often. And meanwhile, there are people who are trying to, there are people who are going through the same struggles, like, um, you know, working, you know, 70 hours a week trying to make ends meet, and they just need to know somebody's there and has their back. There are people who are trying to make these life decisions. They don't have a community. They don't have a faith. They don't have a faith. They don't have a pastor. They can't afford a counselor. And they're just like, would someone please just tell me I'm okay? And, and, and that's where, like, I love listening to the smart guys, man, the smart guys are awesome. And I love listening to, to the debates and the philosophy and the reason and all those kinds of things. And when I was a pastor, I loved the theology when I was going through seminary, but I'm reminded of when I was in a seminary class and we were talking about this theological bullshit and I can't even remember what it was. And it was on a Monday afternoon and that Sunday morning and when I was working in children's ministry, this girl came up to me and said, my dad beats my mom and I don't know what to do. And we have those people in the atheist community, but they don't have a place to go. And, and to to me, that is where that I feel like that's where I'm needed. And I think that's I think that's I think one of the no, more nobler parts of it, um, because um, it's it's it is very needed. And I think the thing is, is that, you know, I'm very interested in this idea of sort of creating a um framework of humanism that is applicable to people you know so i i i, I and and finding ways of of you know taking what sort of the quote-unquote smart guys say and and making it so that it's applicable to people and sort of giving people a sense of what we seek to want you know at, at, you know with with my with my stuff i mean the main things that i'm interested in working on and advocating for is reason scientific progress, humanistic values, and liberal democracy. Those are the yeah. things that unite me. Those are the things that I care about. And one of the things that I sort of wrote about in a piece, and I've described this before, one of the beauties of humanism is that it's not really much of an ism at all. Um, you know, it's so uh, universal, in my opinion, that it actually allows for a multiplicity of worldviews within it. And the beauty of that is that then you can sort of use the wisdom of, of collective wisdom of mankind to sort of apply it to issues. So when someone is struggling, when someone is having problems, you can go, okay, what can we do for these people? Because that's, that is equally important. It's, it, you know, and, and I notice even myself sometimes, and, and, and I sometimes feel bad that perhaps it's a lack of empathy on my part, but I am more interested in some of the ideas, but I think that it's, I think it's certainly, I think, beautiful and noble and certainly uh, necessary for us to not just say what we are, but but be what we are and act as we want to be. And and so I'm I'm very moved by the idea that that we as as sort of secular humanists, what we need to do is really put those principles into action. So whether it's, you know, it's whether it's running for a local election or donating to a local food bank or, you know, um, uh, you know, helping people, uh, you know, you know, you know, helping underprivileged youth, things like that. That's important, too. And, 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 and the thing that the beauty of that is, is that it doesn't matter what your beliefs are, it, you know, it, we're all human and we all have some basic needs. And the other thing is that in order for us to sort of seek, in my opinion, the kind of economic, social and, and social justice that we should want, we have to be able to sort of put some of the petty chauvinisms aside and say, yes, we may not agree on this or that or the other, but we do agree on some very 
basic fundamental things. And those basic fundamental things are are deeply a part of who we are because we are human. And if we can unite people in that regard, that's where we can be successful. Absolutely. And and I, I, you know, you mentioned earlier where you know, there's room for a bunch of worldviews. I was speaking to an, an ex-pastor recently, and we were talking about uh, the atheist meetups in the area. And I've been to a couple out here, and 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 uh, and and for the most part, um, you know, because this this gentleman I was talking to, he's a he's a former pastor as well. So we we critique things uh, in the in the essence in like from the church perspective, and 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 one of the things, you know, the thing like. Um, and I'm not out trying to, to create an, an atheist church. You know, I don't want to get together on Sunday morning or, you know, uh, to be rebellious on, on uh, Thursday morning or something like that and sing three songs and, and, and listen to a speech or whatever. Like, I don't have time for that. I don't want that. Like, I just want, uh, we were talking about how, you know, I've been to the, some of these, there's one atheist meetup I went to and the organizers reached out to me. Uh, they checked out my Facebook page. They knew what I looked like. So when I walked in, they were like, hey, what's going on, Luke? It's so nice to meet you. And 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 when I signed up for the meetup, they said, to be part of this meetup, we require you to come to at least one event a, a, a year. So I was already primed and like I'd already made a commitment to go. And then the other atheist meetup I went to, I walked in the door, nobody said anything. Nobody said hi. Nobody greeted me. Nobody nobody made an effort to be like, hey, is this your first time? Like it was all, you know, I'm an extroverted guy, so I don't have any problem necessarily introducing myself to people. But it was one of those things of like, man, it is hard to break through this. And if you're an introvert, there's no way you're going to come back to this thing. Um, and, and it's... It, and so there, that's a complete tangent because that's nothing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the the guy I was meeting with earlier, he said he felt really uncomfortable because he's a more conservative guy and he feels like he can't even say anything without being labeled this, you know, th this crazy uh, authority. And he, he luckily he's not a Trump supporter, but he um, he he was like, I, you know, I, I feel like I can't say anything regarding like lowering taxes without people jumping down my throat. And I think that's going to hurt the atheist community in the long run. If we we the atheists criticize Republicans and conservatives all the time for marrying their religion and their political beliefs. And if we're not careful, we're going to do the same thing. No, and I, I think you're right. And and in fact, what I would argue, excuse me, one thing I would argue is that I think there are actually very prominent leaders with within the atheist movement who have actually been very critical of the left. Um, so if you look at somebody like Sam Harris mm -hmm. or Peter Bogosian yeah. or James Lindsay, there have been people who have been very critical of sort of what they see as the authoritarian left or what Majid Nawaz, the the um, the uh, Muslim reformer, calls the regressive left, mm -hmm. um, which has sort of become cliche and a talking point these days. But but I think has some validity to it is that there's a real struggle, I think, in our culture between between uh, sort of the, the the broader authoritarianism. So the authoritarianism that we see on the right, which is sort of very politicized, very institutionalized, whether it's, you know, the, the assault on the environment through the EPA or it's the, the, the horrible tax bill that was just passed, which, right. again, there's nothing technically wrong with lowering taxes. The problem is, is that, you know, one of the big talking points that both liberals and conservatives talk about all the time in our government is how we need to take control of the deficit. We need to take control right. of the deficit, this and that and the other. But this blows the deficit up by $1.5 trillion over 10 years. So it's, it's, it, those are contradictions that we have to deal with. And, Absolutely. And, and those are hypocrisies we have to deal with. Having said that, I think there is on authoritarianism on the left. And, and you do see, I mean, what happened to Brett Weinstein, the biology professor at Evergreen College, where basically he was phased out for being just critical of some of the university's activities regarding its equity policy. And basically, and just being critical of them, not, not calling people names, not saying awful things, but just being a, a, a vocal critic of some of what the administration wanted to do. He got called a racist, he got called a bigot, he got called, you know, whatever name you want, and was eventually forced out of the college because he would not tow the line they wanted. Um, uh, the, you know, what happened earlier last year at Middlebury College where 
Charles Murray, the very controversial scholar, um, came to speak at Middlebury College, and they actually brought a liberal progressive professor to come in and grill him on some of his questions. Um, because, you know, Charles Murray is, of course, the infamous um, uh, scholar who wrote The Bell Curve, which is all about race and IQ, and that's very controversial, and he gets called a eugenicist and a racist or whatever. And whatever your feelings about Murray, I, I'm rather agnostic on the subject. I, I feel like you know, uh, Sam Harris did an interview with him, which was interesting. But I, again, I, I, I lean on the side of that. I don't think it's it's worthwhile to sort of elaborate on the, <laughs> the connection between race and IQ. But having said that, by merely attending a lecture of his, you had all these students, which it's fine to protest. It's, it's actually quite OK to protest. I'm all in favor of it. But what ended up happening was was a, essentially a melee where it became complete chaos. And and the the liberal progressive professor who was there to critique him and to criticize his ideas was physically assaulted by the students. She had to get receive medical care afterwards. These are problems. And, and these are serious problems, and, and they speak to a fundamental lack of civility and humility in our culture. And, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, that um, we don't have a sense of that community. We don't have a shared existence together anymore. We don't, we don't seek to have sort of a, a shared communal experience of, 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 of civic life. And, and it, it, it scares me because I feel like you know, the values which we should all seek, which are freedom and justice and tolerance and equality, that these are all going to be scrapped in the sort of in the guise of sort of whatever political tribalism that you seek to do. So I'm, I'm very concerned. And, and, and um, you know, maybe you can speak a little to that. I, I feel like I probably went on a little bit of a tangent there. But but my main but my main point is that I, I am very concerned about the tribalism. And, and yeah. I think it's a huge problem. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any social contract anymore. There doesn't there doesn't seem to be any there doesn't seem to be um any like we're all in this together kind of thing. And I I understand man, it's just it's so complicated because I mean, bottom line is we don't need to we we're not facing uh at least to to a lot of people. I mean, the people who are who are you know without talking about climate change. Um we're not facing uh, we're not struggling to survive. We all get up in the morning. We have water. We have food. Um, I don't need you. You don't need me to go to the grocery store to buy a steak or a meatless something or whatever. Um, you know, we don't. Uh, we're not going out in the wild and and facing these uh, these huge predators in terms of like you know we're not being chased down by lions or, or tigers and bears. Oh my! Like we're just kind of. Like we can all survive on our own on some level. And there's not this idea that we're all in this together. Christians, atheists, Muslims, Buddhists, like whatever, man, like we're all in the Like if, if, if the world goes down, we all go down with it. And, and that's, that's challenging because rather than sitting down and listening to someone and saying, I disagree with you, but that's okay. Um, let's see how many other people we can get to agree and disagree. And then let's come to a compromise. It's like, no, we're going to do it my way or else fuck you. Or no, we're going to do it. Or, and my, my favorite phrase was, is if you don't like it, leave, which is how like five-year-olds argue. <laughs> so, so it's like, no, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to talk to you because that is what adults do. Adults talk to each other when we disagree with something. And then we try to come to a like, imagine if you're, if you're dating or you're married or, and every time you get into an argument, it's like, well, if you don't like it, leave, you know? And that's exactly what's happening to the country. Whenever, whenever the Republicans are in power, well, if you don't like it, leave. If you don't like what Donald Trump is doing, fucking move to Canada. And it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. Like, what if the, what if the Democrats would have said that to Republicans when Barack Obama was president? If you don't like Barack, if you don't like it, just leave. You know, they would have they've been in, on an uprage or an outro, uh, an outrage because it's just uh, it's so frustrating to me that we can't just like be like, OK, I see where you're coming from. I totally disagree with that. Uh, and, and here's why. Yeah. And, and I mean, one other bigger component to this is, you know, there's a terrific book that came out last year, which was, uh, a, I think, a very 
even-handed critique of identity politics uh, is a book called The Once and Future Liberal. Um, well, I haven't read named, that yet, but I've heard about it. Um, by a guy named Mark Lilla. And it's a terrific book. And one of the things he makes a point of is that one of the problems of our politics, and there were two things you mentioned, which I think are incredibly important for democracy. One of them is social contract. I completely agree with you. And the social contract broadly means a respect for and defense of institutions. One of the things we see in our time is this real denial of the importance and the, the, the need for its solid institutions, political institutions, economic institutions, social institutions. And we've seen the sort of social fact break down because of a fundamental distrust of institutions. Some of that is warranted. I mean, if you look at American history, if you look particularly after World War II, you see this gradual decline in trust in institutions. And it comes from the failures of Vietnam, Watergate, um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the war on terror, and now with obviously with with Donald Trump, you see, you know, this this huge wide nationwide distrust of institutions, which I think is unhealthy, because in order to have a successful social contract, you have to have a a dedication to making sure that the fundamental institutions of our of our civic life work. Um, they're not going to be perfect, and the goal is to improve them, but they have to work, and right. they, and you have to and you have to believe in them. You have to have trust in them, right? Um, and if you don't, then 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 things start to crack. The other thing I think that's very important is at the same time that we're losing our our respect and 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 defense of institutions. There's this sort of rap individualism, which has sort of really warped our politics. And it's on both sides of the political spectrum, whether it's sort of the, the radical sort of Ayn Rand libertarian individualism that exists on the right, where it's very much a fuck you, I've got mine. You know, why should I give a shit about other people? I need right. to care about me. And then on the left, there's this sort of rabid individualism in the form of the most extreme forms of identity politics, where, you know, as a whatever, this is my perspective, rather than saying, you know, which is not to say that your your own personal perspective doesn't inform um, what, what, who you are. I think it does. And I think some of that is certainly good. And I'm not, you know, I don't hate identity politics per se on that level. What I do have a problem with is when, is when we give up all sense of sort of reasonable discussions and, and a can sort of a shared con, uh, consideration of the facts and a sense of, of sort of shared goals in the name of identity. That's when we have huge problems. Absolutely. And, go ahead. Well, no, I, I mean, the, the thing that the thing that I think, uh, you know, I identify primarily as someone who's liberal um, just because I like the idea of you know, social safety nets and all those kinds of fun things. But one of the things that drives me nuts about the left, you know, at least with the right, um, they they you it's clearly marked what lines you have to follow in order to, like, be in the right. And the thing yes. about the, the thing about the left is they claim to be this like open minded side of things but you can be open-minded as long as you don't question anything that they really stand for so if you to talk, if you talk to a bernie sanders supporter who was like and which i was who was like hardcore about free college and you were and you would say you know they'd be like, oh this country does free college and this country does free college and you were to point out the fact that like yeah but that country also has like entrance exams and if you don't pass those entrance exams you're tracked to be a mechanic and just like how are we going to pay for that even just to say how are we going to pay for that was like well you don't care about the future of america i'm like no i care about how we're going to pay for that like that's the question Can exactly a question and 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 you should if you're going to if you're going to espouse an idea you should be willing to have it challenged and it's okay to go you know what great question not sure about the answer yet let me get back to you on that um because that's how we learn you know, that's when someone questions me, when someone goes, well, what about this? Like, I don't know about that. Let me look into that. Um, or I might be like, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer, but it doesn't affect my day to day. So I'm just going to carry on. Like, sorry, if that's insignificant to you, if that's so important to you, go ask somebody else that's smarter than me. Um, like that's, I mean, No, I, I completely <laughs> agree. I mean, for example, when I when I was, you know, I've been very critical of the 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 Republican tax plan, which I think is absolutely disastrous. I think it's a huge giveaway to rich people at the expense of the middle class. And, and, and if you look at it, the thing about it, there are some things in it that 
that I think are actually quite good. One of them is lowering the corporate tax rate. That's actually something, even as a liberal, as a, as a left-leaning liberal, I think lowering the corporate tax rate is totally fine. If you look at the at the most, most of the developed world, particularly in Europe, if you look at their corporate tax rates in relation to ours or what they were before the tax reform, they were much lower than ours. Now, mind you, they also paired that with very high sales taxes. I mean, right. that's part of how they pay for the social safety net is through is through sales taxes. So you pay out the ass for bread or milk or right. whatever the fuck ever. Right. Um, mind you, we also do that too. We just don't do it through high sales taxes. We basically pay twice for some of our agriculture culture because we pay for it in the form of subsidies. Yeah. Um, but, but I guess my broader point is that it's it's I have no problem with trying to find ways in which to make the tax code leaner and better for you know entrepreneurship and and innovation and the sort of the dynamic nature of capitalism which we certainly need. What I had a huge problem with was this idea that in order to do that we're going to do this huge overhaul of the tax code um, some of which was written in the middle of the night, some of which was handwritten when they passed the bill, which is disastrous for the deficit. And then and then at the same time, you're going to so you're going to you're going to pass this bill. It's not going to be deficit neutral. It's going to add to the national debt. And then when you do that, you can you can then do the sort of, you know, what Sam Cedar calls the one two punch where you can sort of do this. And then the other thing that goes, well, you know, that deficit's really bad, isn't it? You know, our debt's really, really terrible. You know what we need to do now? We need to cut benefits for poor people. That's yeah. how we're that's how we're going to balance it. And I find that to be irresponsible. Um, and, and because it, it, it lacks a serious consideration of of what we're supposed to do as a country. And that's really my huge problem with it. But that goes back into, I think, some of the larger fundamental problems of our country, which is sort of the, the you know, and, and this is where I'm going to sound very typically liberal is, you know, income inequality is super high. Sure. Um, the fact that, you know, the vast majority of the, our political leaders are, are essentially um, the pawns of the elites, the, the, the you know, and that they, um, that they are funded by very wealthy corporate donors. And that's on both sides of the political spectrum. And the fact that we don't, like other industrialized countries, we don't have public elections where they're paid for with tax dollars. And we have, and you know, you have limits on how many days you can campaign and things like that. I mean, here's, here's something to think about. It's kind of interesting. In Canada, when they have their parliamentary elections, it's 75 days. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? 75 days. Yeah, the 2020 election's about to start. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> essentially, it started on Inauguration Day. It did. When, when Donald did. Trump uh, when Donald Trump uh, filed his paperwork with the FCC to run in 2020. Oh. Um, it, so, but here in the United States, we, had a, we basically have a presidential campaign cycle that lasts in earnest about two years. And... and, and that's crazy, right? I mean, that there's something fundamentally wrong about that, where we spend billions of dollars on elections, and we spend two, two we spend billions of dollars on elections. We go through this rigorous process, and at the end of the day, the two candidates that we got were the most unliked modern presidential candidates in American history. They were both unliked. And, and it truly became the issue of the lesser of two evils. And again, this goes back to that, you know, to sort of bring it full circle. This talks about this sort of fundamental breakdown of the social fabric and the social contract and how because our culture has become so individualized, we lack a sense of sort of common language about how we deal with with our own problems. Absolutely. And I, I love like to back up to when you're talking about the tax bill, you did something that a lot of people are unable to do. At least it seems like they're unable to do. You said, I like this. I don't like that. And and that's something that like it sounds so elementary and so trivial and so ridiculous. But turn on the TV and, and tell me anybody else that does that in the public eye. Tell me anybody that gets up there and says, I really like this element of the bill because this is a good thing. I don't like this, and here's why I don't like that. And it's, it's the same thing, like if you looked at when they talked about Obamacare, like there were some, th my, my brother brought up a great point. He had a, a friend of his who's a mechanic who was making $100,000 a year. And when Obamacare went through, he didn't qualify for subsidies, and he basically paid $15,000 that year for health insurance, which was like crazy, crazy money, because mm -hmm. 
the the the, the company got bought out and they didn't you know he had to go didn't couldn't go through the exchange or whatever but instead of saying it's really good now that we have a federally we have federally regulated paradigms of what has to be covered and what needs to be covered and what you can and can't do as an insurance company they're like fuck it burn the house down start all over again and like that's that's what so many people do with everything democrats do it to republicans republicans do it to democrats atheists do it to christians christians do it to muslims muslims do it to, i mean it's everybody does it to the other group and it's like can't we for a minute say those Christians are doing pretty good at feeding, feeding people. Maybe I should help them. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, absolutely. I totally agree. And I would add one other thing, which I think is really, really interesting. So one of the weird modern phenomenons of our politics, which I think is, it's both, I think, I think it's very sobering to say the least is that if you know a person's position on one issue, doesn't really matter what one it is. It could be abortion, guns, the environment, taxes, whatever. If you know that one position, chances fucking are you're going to pretty much know their position on everything else. Yeah. There's a real homogenization of sort of political factions in this country that didn't really exist at the end of World War II. There's some really interesting polling data about how the the, the parties weren't terribly indicative of partisanship. There were there were sort of in the 1950s and 60s there were very liberal Republicans, people like Nelson Rockefeller and Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney. And then there were also like Southern conservative Dixiecrats, people like Robert Byrd and Strom Thurmond. And the parties were always indicative of what political beliefs would, would be. This all changes with the sort of conservative ascendancy of the 1980s, and especially once you go into the 1990s. There's this real consolidation of partisanship that happens in the parties where people who identify as liberal almost overwhelmingly become Democrats and people who identify as conservative overwhelmingly become Republicans. And the, 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 and the sort of middle of that, where you have a liberal Republican or a conservative Democrat, there's a very, that, that window is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's a huge problem for democracy because then basically we have two factions who don't just disagree about how to solve problems, but actually fundamentally disagree on what the problems actually are. And so when you get into that position, it allows for a certain level of just sheer breakdown of how it actually works. And then again, that goes, and again, my thinking on the subject is the politics, our political leaders are reflections of us, whether we like it or not. Absolutely. So what that says about us is that, you know, if I tell you something very weird, like if I tell you I am for the estate tax, nine times out of 10, if you then say, are you pro-choice? The answer is going to be yes. Mm -hmm. And those two things have nothing to do with each other, right? Right. Or, or if somebody is vehemently anti-abortion, people who are vehemently pro-life, almost overwhelmingly support the death penalty. Absolutely. And there's a weird dynamic there. And again, it goes back to this sort of tribalism in our politics, which is... I think very dangerous to the nature of how liberal democracies work, which they're built on compromises. They're built on, on sort of making a deal and saying, okay, I'm not going to get everything I want, but I'm going to get 40% of what I want or 50% of what I want or 60. And I'll come back for the other bit later. There was a real sense of, of, of how that used to work back in the sort of post-war years where that was the norm, where, you know, the most productive Congress in American history was in the 1960s when Lyndon Johnson was president. More bills were passed out of the U.S. Senate than any time in American history. Now we live in a period of time where it's the least amount of bills that have ever been passed by the United States Senate. That, that is, I think, a huge problem for how we actually get anything done. Well, and I think the other issue too Along with that is you look at folks who don't, and, this, I, and I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, look at people who don't read anymore. 
They get up in the morning, they watch their cable news, they listen to Rush Limbaugh or, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of anybody who I can think of that's kind of a crazy Rush Limbaugh on the liberal side. It's hard to think of one of those because liberal folks just, you know. I mean, Shank Uger, the Young Turks, tends to be yeah, kind of. Yeah, the, that's the, yeah, yeah. The, the Young Turks <laughs> would be good. That, that they're, they're good. For some reason, that they're not, they weren't on my radar when I was trying to think of that. You look at people who, I know people who are strong John Kasich supporters for the primaries because Rush didn't really like Donald Trump during the primaries. And then Kasich loses and all of a sudden Rush starts to warm up to Trump. And now all of a sudden they warm up to Trump. And it's like, people don't sit down with the New York times or the LA times or your local newspaper. They don't sit down with that or they don't get online and read local news stories. They listen for the 15 second sound bite that's aired on the radio 45 million times a day. And the, the, the six minute breaking news clips from CNN or Fox news or MSNBC or whatever. And nobody goes in depth on any issue. They don't think about issues. They just, and, and the, the, the tragedy is everyone listening to this is going to be nodding their head going, fuck yeah. Cause the people that listen to this are the people that think <laughs> like, like we are the people who think, and it's, uh, it's yeah. infuriating when you talk to someone who's like Trump's Trump's got more done this year than anybody else has. And you're just like, uh, you voted for John Kasich in the primaries. I know you did because <laughs> you didn't like Trump. Remember that? And it's, it's just, it, and the, even to, to, to your point too, about the identity, you know, if someone's pro-choice, um, that most likely there are, if they're for the estate tax, they're probably pro choice. Was that the one you did there? Yeah. Is, yeah. So, yeah. If, if you d take it even more to the extreme, if you wear cowboy boots and go to country music, <laughs> yeah, you're a Trump supporter. Like exactly. it's, it's that like I, cause I do those things. I love country music and I love wearing my cowboy boots and I love going to concerts. And every time we go to one of those, I'm just kind of uncomfortable because there's a lot of red hats in the room. I know. I feel the same way. So, so I'm an, I'm a massive heavy metal fan and oh, I love yeah. So you like death. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm a huge metal fan and you know, Metal fans, I think, are unfairly maligned for being kind of dumb and, and, and kind of white trash. And and some of that is I, some of that's true. But it is weird because, you know, I don't always fit in in some of the situations. Like, for example, like I'm a massive. So I'm like like I'm very much interested in ideas and philosophy and things like that. But like I absolutely love Elvis. I, you know, yes. I, 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 I love um, you know, I love, you know, I love fried chicken. I love a good, you know, I love a good old fashioned, you know, um, you know, uh, you How about know, just a good old fashioned, you could just, yeah, good old fashioned, right exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know, I enjoy, you know, there's nothing more magical to me than to me, like a big tall glass of a Coca-Cola classic, some fried mm. chicken, mashed potatoes with that a little bit of rum in there, a little bit of rum. <laughs> that shit's magical. Right. And, yeah. and the thing is, it's like, you know, yeah, I'm a liberal and in a lot of ways I'm a leftist, but I'm from Indiana and yeah. that kind of like it informs who I am. Like I'm Midwestern. Right. Yeah. And the problem that I have with the left sometimes, and it's, is that there's a certain smugness that mm -hmm. I, and fortunately I think they're starting to get out of that. I mean, if you look at the election of, of, of the new governor of Virginia, if you look at the election of Doug Jones down in Alabama, if you look at what they're really trying to do, they're really trying to remember like, Hey, one of the one of the core things is that you know we need to have a stronger like economic message about you know because there are a lot of good folks and i will stand by this and i know people will give me shit for it there are a lot of decent people who voted for donald trump you're absolutely right you and, that and that's so important to remember you know that when, when hillary clinton went out there and said that the half of them were a basket of deplorables she's probably not wrong like in, I would say it's probably more like a quarter. Yeah. Uh, there were some people who supported Donald Trump who were truly disgusting people. Like, let's not, you know, let's not over under, you know, let's not understate that. I mean, there were people who were white supremacists. There were white nationalists. Sure. There were neo-Nazis. There were, there were, were essentially fascists of any sort of stripe who supported Donald Trump and people who were racist and people who were sexist and people who were violent. Like, I'm not like, don't get me wrong. Having right. said that, that is not indicative of the average voter. And at the end of the day, there were a lot of people who, when they went in the voting booth, their thought was like, you know, he is a fucking asshole, but I just don't like Hillary Clinton. And they yep. pulled the fucking lever. And I think that 
it's important to remember that uh, and, the, and the inverse of that is also true. Like we don't also don't want to over empathize too, because like at Absolutely. the end of the day, she won the popular vote. Right. And had she spent time in like Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio, instead of going to places like Georgia and Texas and Arizona for no fucking reason, this goes to show you the hubris of her campaign. <laughs> she would have won the election because that that election was swung by 80 to 100,000 votes in like three or four states. Oh, absolutely. And and you uh, I love what I love what you said about there are some decent people that voted for Donald Trump. And if you are kind of one of those hardcore leftist alarmists, that's that just that statement, good people voting for Donald Trump just does not compute. Like I can see people's heads about to explode when they hear that phrase. And and it's it's hard to reconcile. And partially it's hard to reconcile because a lot of people that share my last name voted for Donald Trump. And they are people who will pull over on the side of the road and help you change a tire. There are people who will plow out your driveway when it's in the winter time. There are people who will bring food to you when you're hungry. There are people who will do all these things that, that they, that, that they, for some reason, just like, don't think the whole country should do. Like, I just don't understand it, but it's, it's hard and it's hard to reconcile sometimes when you think about it. And it's just, uh, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And so the, the I think the main issue that we have as a country is trying to reconcile sort of how we rebuild for this, because, um, you know, I mean, Donald Trump is the worst president in my lifetime. Absolutely. Uh, he's I can't I mean, stand the guy. As like, as, as, yeah, well. he's he's truly the worst. I mean, he's literally a a hornet's nest of just yeah. everything yeah. awful about America. Um, if you were to take everything that sucks about the United States and sort of put it into one singular person, <laughs> it, it you know it's the the garishness, the selfishness, the 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 brutishness, the xenophobia, the ethnocentrism, the 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 tacky, the sheer tackiness of it, the nouveau riche faux uh, you know elitism of him you put it all in one package, you know, I mean, I came to political consciousness during the Bush years and I can't, I could never imagine that it could get worse, but it did. And so this is the thing I try to tell people is like, look, trust me, I have my issues with the left, but let's put this shit in perspective here. The Republican party have, 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 have nominated and elected two of the worst incompetent men to have ever been in the white house yeah and that is terrifying but the There's, base loves a man that's the thing i don't understand is the people that voted for trump are like he's doing so good okay so okay i'm so glad you, i'm so glad you mentioned this maybe are you you're, you're smarter than me can you explain yeah. that to me please okay so here's my thinking so because i want to ask you a little bit about this too because this is yeah. a question i've been asking people on my podcast and so i'll give you kind of my take and then i'll ask you sure so here's my thinking about it. The thing about Donald Trump that is incredibly, I think, compelling to people is, and I heard, I think I heard this on a podcast, may have been maybe the Ezra Klein show, somebody mentioned this, but the thing about, the thing is here, here in the United States, we had the economic collapse of 2008. And it was a very watershed moment for our lives. And, and it was, you know, vast amounts of wealth uh, were erased in a matter of months and a vast amount of human misery came as a result of it. Now we're out of, we're, you know, we're 10 years later, nearly 10 years out of the crisis, right? You know, the wall street's doing great stock markets, record highs, unemployment's about 4%. We're at near full employment under labor statistics. The country has between somewhere between three and 4% growth. It'd be better if we had four or five, but three or four is not bad. Right. We've had, you know, things are going okay, right? But there's a huge part of the country that never fucking recovered, ever. Yeah. And the thing you have to keep in mind is when the collapse of 2008 happened, there was a huge concerted effort by the political institutions, and that's around the globe. So as you can say what you want about the Bush presidency, which I think it was a menagerie of awfulness. 
um, is that, you know, George W. Bush understood the gravity of how fucking bad the crisis was. Yeah. Which is why it was like, we need it. We need to kick our Keynesianism and overdrive. We need to pass this TARP bill. We need to save the banks. We need to do this. We need to do that. The Obama administration came in and they passed a slew of economic and social reforms in order to deal with some of the, the rampant inequality as a result of this collapse. There were, there was, there was, and this happened around the globe, whether it was you know, Gordon Brown's government in the UK, Angela Merkel comes to power and solves her problem within the EU, the problems within the EU. And so we lived through the economic crisis, right? And because we had to deal with the economic crisis and the people who in power were in action mode, the political crisis didn't happen. The sort of crisis of democracy didn't happened. It was staved off because everybody was busy making sure that the world economy didn't go off a cliff. Now that the economy is doing better and all of the deep-seated political problems that were as a result of this rampant misuse of global capitalism, those now came back to the fore. And so we're now living through the political crisis that we should have had 10 years ago. And in my estimation, the reason why I think people like Trump is, is, and to bring kind of make what I just said to you relevant, is there are a slew of people in this country who feel like they have been left behind, right? That yeah. they've been promised by both parties and people of all political stripes, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to save your job, we're going to save your home, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And they never do it, ever. And again, that has to go back to we have a political system that's fundamentally owned by money and special right. interests. Right. And it's on both sides. It's not exclusively partisan, although I would argue it's a little worse on the Republican side, because at least the Democrats pretend to give a shit about regular people. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but Donald Trump represents these people have been bullied for so long. Right. They, whether they lost their job at the steel plant, they lost their job at the coal plant. And, and they keep seeing this country changing where more and more people who don't look like them are getting ahead and they're not. Right. And they constantly get told by the media and the mainstream and everything that they're a bunch of dipshits, that they're a bunch of backward hicks, that they're awful. And they feel like they're being bullied, whether or not that's the reality of other situation. But they feel like they're being constantly bullied all the time. And into this power vacuum of awfulness comes Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is the uber bully, right? He right. is the living embodiment of what a asshole looks like, right? And so it's the classic example. I, I just spent a few minutes basically describing to you the reason why people think people like him is they say he's an asshole, but he's our asshole. Yeah. And that he's, he's a fucking bully, but he's our bully. Right. And so that's why he will always have, you know, whether it's somewhere between 30 and 35 and 40 percent of the country who will always fucking love him because he represents that part of the country that feels like they they whether it's right or wrong, they feel like they've been left behind and they feel like they've been bullied because they've been constantly told how awful they are. And they're like, you know what? We're constantly being told how awful we are. Why don't we just start actually being fucking awful? Yeah. And, and so Donald Trump represents that. But what I don't think they understood was the gravity to which the, how bad this was going to be for our democracy, because Donald Trump is truly terrible. And he's the living embodiment of of somebody who's going to tell you all of these things and make people happy. But in the reality, he is your living, breathing corporatist Republican. I mean, whether it's that tax bill or his 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 decimation of the EPI under Scott Pruitt or the, the, the getting rid of some of the national landmarks, if, if you know, if uh, putting somebody who is sort of a, a, a pro private school uh, zealot at the head of education, if you look at what he's trying to do, it's a massive assault on the on the on the public sphere. It's a massive assault on democracy, but people don't care because all of the emotional buttons are being hit. And oh, totally. Of, and and for some conservatives, so like what? Because my question for you is, why do you think evangelicals like Trump? Because because Trump won evangelicals in 2016 by 81 percent of the vote. To give you context, George W. Bush in the 2004 reelect, which was the God, guns and gays election, that election, he got 79 percent of the evangelicals. So Trump got more of them a decade later and and they still love him and they still stick to him. Why? Why do you think that is that that now that's a great question. I 
am in supremely underqualified to answer it, but I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> okay. Evangelicals, when when Barack Obama got elected, and I mean, th- first of all, think about when Barack Obama first got elected. He was interviewed by an evangelical pastor, Rick Warren, at Saddleback Church. He was interviewed, I think, in 07 or 08. Um, I think it was 07 or 08, when he got interviewed and was asked about his his faith, asked about if he had a relationship with Jesus and all that kind of fun stuff. From from Obama's first election until recently, the Christ, Christians feel like their faith is under attack. So they've been convinced that the world is becoming increasingly secular, which it is, but they have been convinced that because gays can get married now and because they can't allegedly can't say Merry Christmas anymore because those are the two most important things, right? To, to religious people saying Merry Christmas and gays getting married. That seems to be what evangelicals care the most about. They, they are, they feel like their, their uh, religion is under assault and Donald Trump says he's a Christian. He says that the U S was a Christian nation. I think he mentioned that a few times. I'm not sure if he actually said those words. Roy Moore sure did. But they see Donald Trump as their Christian savior because he says the right words. And this is the thing you have to understand about evangelicals and every evangelical will disagree with this statement. But this is the thing you have to understand about evangelicals. They don't care how you live. They care about what you say. To an evangelical, it is not important that you don't cheat on your wife. It's not important that you don't hit on teenage girls. It's not important that you it's not important that you are not uh, divorced. It's important that you say it's wrong. You can do it all you want. You just have to say it's wrong because evangelicals are not about action. They're about belief. The evangelical mindset, they're not the social justice warriors. They're not the people going out and protesting. They're the people that go to their churches on Sunday mornings and they believe in their heart that God, that Jesus, that God loves them and that Jesus raised them from the dead and that they're going to heaven. And that's where their faith, their faith is all cerebral. It's all about what you say and what you believe. It has nothing to do with what you do. And a larger part. And Roy Moore is a perfect example of that. He said all the right things. So they supported him. Matthew McConaughey, several years ago, when he was giving an accepted speech, said something like, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they were like, oh, my God. Matthew McConaughey loves Jesus. He just did a movie about AIDS, but he loves Jesus. <laughs> and, and it's like, because it's about, for evangelicals, it's about what you say. If you come out and you say, I am a Christian, I believe that God put us here on this earth and that, that God has our back and that, that, I, that Jesus lives in my heart, they will vote for you all day long. Because to the evangelical, it's important to have someone who believes what they believe in power. That's why an evangelical Christian can come out there and say, I'm a Christian first, a Republican second, and an American third, Mike Pence. Imagine, oh, yeah. imagine if. Imagine if someone came out and said, I'm a Muslim first, a Democrat second, and an American third. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, or, 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 you know, somebody like me, you know, I'm an atheist first, I'm a liberal second, and I'm a Democrat third. Woo, baby. I mean, you know, you might as well, I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, you know, Sean Hannity's head would explode. Yeah, but, and, and that's but the, the evangelical, to understand the evangelical movement, it's really simple. You just have to accept the fact that they don't care about what you do and what you say. They have a fundamental disconnect there. If you say Jesus, that's it. Like if you say Jesus, the blood of Jesus literally covers over all the bad shit you've ever done in your life. And that's how they see it. So that's why some a-hole can get out there and say, well, you know, Roy Moore hit on teenagers, but that's okay because Mary was a teenager when Jesus married or when when Joseph married her. You know, I think you are absolutely (gasps) right. It's frustrating as hell. Don't get me wrong. It's frustrating as hell. But I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, you were worried about taking a stab at this, but I think you absolutely nailed it. Uh, I think you're right. Um, uh, you know, my answer was going to be something along the lines of sort of a real politic, you know, Trump promised them all these things. And then he actually, in a lot of ways, actually 
came through on some of them, whether it was Gorsuch on the court, the trying to get rid of the Johnson Amendment, moving the capital of, is, uh, of, of Israel to Jerusalem, like that shit evangelicals really wanted, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and so some of it I think is real politic, but I do think you're absolutely right, which is if you look at, it's so funny, you know, it's so funny, you're, you've nailed it and, and, it's, and the data backs it up. So if you look at some of the polling data that came out um, around the, the Roy Moore election, some of it also came around Donald Trump, because obviously Donald Trump has his own, um, his own uh, problems with sexual harassment, sexual assault, and obviously the Access Hollywood tape, which everybody thought would kill him, but it didn't, um, is this thing where if you look at sort of conservatives, uh, compared to liberals or Democrats compared to Republicans. And you ask them a question of something along the lines of, um, does a person's private life have any influence in how you feel about them as public leaders? And Democrats care more about that than Republicans do. And then within Republicans, the conservative, the hardline conservatives or evangelicals care more, uh, care less about it than the mainline Republicans. So it's this interesting dynamic where, you know, as you've said, they don't care about what these people do. They care about making sure they hit all the right notes. And, um, you know, because with Donald Trump, I mean, in terms of hitting the right notes, I mean, he was a masterful, you know, maestro of a symphony of bullshit. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, when he when you know, and so he he made everybody happy in that regard. Um, and it's terrifying because. You know, the implications are serious. I mean, moving the capital of Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem is a huge problem internationally. Absolutely. And and that's and that's all the thing that frustrates the hell out of me about that is that that's a religious belief that is influencing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's it's because and the, the, the crazy thing about it is like these Christians believe that when the capital moves, that that's going to usher in Armageddon. Yeah. Like like they they're trying to accelerate Jesus coming back by being like, hey, fuck it. Let's burn the place down. You are absolutely right. There was a, a terrific Twitter thread by um, a Christian scholar named uh, Diana Butler Bass. And she did this really great tweet thread basically saying, like, you guys know why the evangelical right cares so much about this. You know, it's it, it, it's really about them wanting to bring on the end of the right. world. And it's it's and that's the thing people have to keep in mind. Like, that's the kind of scary scenario that we're in, um, you know, not to mention the fact that, you know, in, in, in many ways, I mean, this is going to kill any semblance of a two state solution. Oh, absolutely. The, the Palestinians won't come to the table. And essentially, the far right, the authoritarian right of Israel under the Netanyahu regime is essentially solidified its connection with the Trump uh, administration here in Washington. And it's it is a a very scary scenario in which uh, we lose all semblance of American, um, you know, consistent American policy in regards to Israel. And that to me, that's a huge issue. And and, and so, you know, I, I, I Trump represents truly represents everything I hate about my country. And, <laughs> so and, and, and I, you know, the anti intellectualism that mixed with an extreme cockiness that is unbelievable. I mean, he's the living, breathing embodiment of the Dunning Kruger effect. It, it is this this idea that he's such a fucking moron, but yet thinks he's the smartest man in the room. You know, at least with George W. Bush, he had some semblance of humility to know, hey guys, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I know that Trump is not only the dumbest person in the room, he doesn't know that. So he thinks that he's the smartest person in the room. That's fucking terrifying. That makes George Bush look like fucking Lincoln compared to Trump. Oh, absolutely. And I think the the biggest question and the toughest part, I think the toughest part for me is that he's doing this and he's eating up so much of the news cycle and there's so many other things going on. You know what I mean? Like there's so oh, much, yeah. there, there's so much, and, and, and not even just like, not even outlandish things, but just like, there's just so much else going on in the world that, that this is eating it up. And I think that's what gets it back to like, like, that's why, I think that's why you and I both like take the time to do this stuff every week because, because we know there's other stuff going on. And, and the thing too is like, you know, we still, you know, whether you like it or not, he's the president. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and hopefully he gets impeached, but who knows, but what do we do in the meantime? Like we all, like there are still people 
like there are people who get up every day and still have to worry about paying their bills. There are people yeah. who get up, there are people who get up every day who, whose mom just died. There are people who get up every day who have a family member dealing with cancer and, and that's the humanity that's going on here. Yep. And that's, that's every day what, there's, there's a gay or, or transgender youth who's kicked out of their home because their parents are religious nutcases. Exactly. It, so it's, you know, or there's a child that no longer has health insurance because Congress failed to, to reauthorize the child um, health insurance program. It, the, there are real world consequences of Donald Trump being a colossal fucking moron. Sure. It, 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 and the fact that every time he says something monumentally fucking stupid on Twitter, I mean, he just did it this week with the fucking North Koreans and shit, basically doing a dick measuring right. contest right. with nuclear weapons, which, uh, again, um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest that this world has ever gotten to nuclear annihilation, they were really fucking smart people working on that. And, and John F. Kennedy was somebody who, not imperfect, I mean, he was a C student at Harvard. He was not a genius by any stretch of the imagination, but somebody deeply uh, in tune with what was going on and had a deep sense of, of, of listening to the advisors that he had. You know, Donald Trump doesn't have any understanding of that. He, because to him, everything is zero sum. Everything is. I win, you lose. There's no sense of like a win-win situation or, or a lose-lose situation. He doesn't give a shit because he has the mind of a child. So it, it's, it's because he's never actually really had to be that smart. I mean, when your dad is a very successful fucking real estate uh, guy from Queens and gives you all this fucking money and banks give you money and you take advantage of the fact that banks give you money and then they know that when, you, when you've been lent that much fucking money and you can't pay back your loans and that they'll collapse if you, if you default on them, that they'll keep giving you money, then you can have this, this sort of semblance of looking like you're successful when you haven't. I mean, last year I read this book um, by an investigative journalist named David K. Johnston. He wrote a book called The Making of Donald Trump. It is the most, one of the most sobering books I've ever read. And, and it's scary because Donald Trump has never made an honest dollar in his life, period. And he has been crooked from day one, and he has been disgusting from day one. And the problem I had with the last election cycle, and I hate to relitigate it, but it's important, the media were so fucking obsessed with describing how awful Hillary Clinton was that they forgot to really remind you what made Donald Trump awful. Like they would get mad about the tweets and everything and they get mad at him in his fucking rally saying stupid shit. But they didn't go into the fact that like the reason that Trump, Trump Tower is built by concrete, not steel, is because the, the concrete at the time was controlled by the fucking mafia in the, in, the, in the city of New York. And he was in bed with the mafia and the fact that he didn't pay off his fucking workers who built the fucking tower and they sued him. And it, th these are things people needed to know and the media didn't care. And that's what frustrated me so much was every time you focus on the tweet or some dumb he says or some stupid shit he does. Does, it takes away from the fact that he is a deeply, deeply incapable and unstable man who is deeply committed to undermining our democracy. And that's what is so fucking frustrating about dealing with it. And to be completely honest, I hate spending so much of my fucking brain, so much of my goddamn brain matter thinking about him. That's no, the, and, yeah. And, no, and, and you're, you're so right. And, and the, the thing that, uh, the challenging part at the end of, at the end of every one of my shows, I ask, and when, I, when I'm, when I'm interviewing someone, it's really fun. Um, at the end of each one of my shows, or if, if I'm interviewing someone, I ask somebody why we might not be screwed after all, because, because if you think about what we've spent probably what the last, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes on, like it looks really dismal, but the, the but, but the, the reality of things, I mean, the, and, and, and some things politically are dismal, but if you think about it, when the hurricanes hit last year, mosques, churches, with the exception of uh, Joel Osteen's church, but eventually they jumped on board. Mosques, churches, um, people came together to help each other. 
Southwest flew, I don't know how many people out for like crazy cheap flights. I mean, even these big corporations were like, Hey, you got to get out. We're going to get you out. Like there was a, uh, I was reading, I can't remember the article. I think it was in the Washington post or something like that. There was a new gene therapy for childhood leukemia that was developed last year where like the survival rate now is, is, you know, like 85% survival rate. Like there are, there are people every day. I mean, shit, we launched a rocket, like SpaceX launched like what 19 rockets last year into the sky and brought them back. Like we're developing the hyperloop. I mean, there's all kinds of like human ingenuity is crazy off the charts right now. Absolutely. And we can't even, and, and, and we can't even be happy about it because some jack off is sitting in the white house. And the thing is like, like there's good happening in the world, but the mm-hmm. problem is we have to look for it. And like, I- that's, and to me like that, You know, that a lot of it is my mission is like, hey, there are some good things happening in the world. And it breaks my heart when I ask somebody, why are we going to be okay? And they can't answer that question. I I completely agree. I I often say that progress happens in spite of ineptitude. Um, And, and, you know, if you look at the world, you know, and I've said this for, for a long time, and I still think this, I mean, one of my favorite books is The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker. It's a terrific book. It's all about how violence has declined um, and how there has essentially been that we are now among one of the most peaceful times in human history. Right. I am a firm believer, despite everything that, we f- that faces us, today is the best day that the human race has ever had and tomorrow will be better. Yeah. And that, you know, we are in the we are in the grasp of eliminating global extreme poverty that that, uh, you know, the extreme poverty will go away by 2030, that extreme hunger will go away by probably 2050, that, that, that the world is getting better in so many ways. And yes, we face serious challenges, whether it's income inequality, climate change, um, the the sort of massive assaults on, on the public or democracy. We do face those issues, but there's so much that is so fundamentally good that will happen in spite of how awful other things may be. I mean, and, not and only that, I, think about what you and I are doing right now i mean we're sitting here having a conversation i'm in california you're in indiana and like like it not only that like as atheists we can talk about it i mean i'm thankful every day that i live somewhere where i can be blatantly non-religious and not have to worry about dying absolutely i live in such immense privilege it's part of the reason i do what i do is that there's so many people around the globe who cannot speak out against superstition they cannot speak right. out against irrationality they cannot speak out against religion they're either killed or they're imprisoned um if you think of somebody like raif badawi who has been imprisoned by the saudi government for what is it now almost six years um uh you know despite the reforms of that country you know if you look at egypt which is looking to pass a law basically banning atheism right um but you know, there are things that, that, that do give me hope. And that's part of the reason that I do what I do is not just what happens around the globe, but what happens in this country. There's so many young people in this country. Like I said, you know, whether it's, you know, some young kid who lives in the Bible Belt, who is starting to question his pastor or or uh, or a young transgender youth who's looking to to escape the oppression of of the home that they live in you know every time that i turn on the record button and i do this show i do it as sort of a beacon for those who cannot speak up absolutely know? because i'm a firm believer that that if if you have the ability to speak out you must do it it is it is imperative on you if you seek to make the world better that you must speak out about it because if you cannot if you will not, then then people of lesser intent and of lesser morality and of lesser uh, intellect will. Um, so it, it's it's imperative that we do that. I hope that I haven't taken you too much down a bad rabbit hole with no man, not at all no um, no because I, I wanted to make sure that we covered enough of what you're doing with your content and everything. So so you have so you have two shows right. Uh, well, I, I, uh, we were doing, we were doing a midweek meditation and that was really fun, but it wasn't getting, uh, right now with what I'm doing in life in terms of, you know, trying to make money and pay rent. Um, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, in terms of time wise, the midweek meditations weren't quite making, um, there wasn't enough of a response for them to continue at this point. So those are kind of on hold for now. 
Um, cause I was doing, a, I was doing my weekly show on Sundays and I was doing the midweek meditations on Wednesdays, but Wednesday gets here really fast. Um, and it was just kind of like, uh, eventually I still want to do those cause I taught yoga for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really enjoy those, but in terms of like where I need to put my time and effort, uh, it needs to go to the, uh, like the weekly show, um, that we do on Sunday. So right now it's just the, your atheist pastor show. And then I'm, I'm currently on the, uh, hosting a, a, a radio show with a friend of mine, but that's probably going to end in January for basically the same reasons, trying to refocus and re-engage, um, and put my energy towards one thing. Okay. Sounds great. So, so I guess to cap off tonight, what are you most excited about coming into 2018? Cause Ooh. this, this is going to be your episode is the first episode of my show for 2018. Oh my gosh. Wow. So. Setting the tone. <laughs> um, oh, so ignore everything we said about Donald Trump. No, um, man, what am I most excited? I'm excited about a lot. I mean, just like, on a personal level, I, I've, I have found, a, a, I never thought I'd find a woman that I'd be happy living with and seeing every day and, and all that. And I mean, that's just one of those simple little, you know, little joys that I have every day is I get up to a, a, a lovely lady and a cute ass little poodle. Um, <laughs> but I also never thought I'd, I'd love the poodle. Um, but I do, she's just, uh, you know, so I mean, that's on a, you know, on just kind of a, a family level. I mean, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm excited about where our show is going to go. Like we've had so many different, we've had so many people reach out and just say, thank you. And I've gotten so many great emails and like, you know, I mean, you, you, you say these things out into the universe and you hope someone's listening and you hope you're making a difference and you hope that someone is like, Hey, that guy's got some decent things to say. Uh, And, and we've gotten some great feedback and it's been really fun. Um, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about some other kind of potential things that I don't want to necessarily like throw out there yet because I'm like, I don't want to ruin them. That's <laughs> all right. I don't want them to not have it, but man, I'm just excited. I mean, I'm excited about everything in life. I mean, I get up every day and, and it's a challenge because I'm dog sitting for Rover and I'm teaching random yoga classes and I'm teaching yoga classes in breweries and I'm stressed about whether or not I'm going to make the rent. And I might have to tell some of my credit card bills, like, sorry guys, I can't pay you. Um, but I'm not getting up every day and going to a, a job that I hate uh, I'm getting to meet fantastic people. I get to come on your show, which is a blast. Um, you know, we're Thank interacting. You. We're interacting with people all over the country and and all over the world. And it's it's man, there's a lot more good than bad. The problem is you just hear about the bad, and and that's. I mean, there's a lot of bad. Don't get me wrong. Like, please don't think I'm burying my head in the sand. But um, if I didn't think it was if I didn't think it was going to be better, I wouldn't get up in the morning and do what I do. And, and I, I didn't think I could make it better. Um, you know, and that's a man, like, I wish I could say, Oh, I'm so excited. I'm publishing a book this year or like, I'm so excited, you know, (laughs) but I'm just, I mean, I'm excited about getting up in the morning and I'm excited about, about what I get to do and who I get to meet and, and who knows what the day is going to bring or who knows who I'm going to get a chance to listen to, or who knows what line in a book I'm going to read or what email I'm going to send or what email I'm going to receive or what opportunity is going to come my way. Like, unless we get hit by a nuclear bomb from North Korea, like I'm going to get up and try to make tomorrow really good. And, and, you know, I mean, that's, man, was so what am I excited about 2018? I'm excited about waking up tomorrow morning. Like, that's what I'm excited about. And that's cliche and silly, but ridiculously true. No, I, I think it's, I think it's really, I think it's beautiful. I, I think it's really beautiful. And, and I, I have just been so inspired by your optimism, by your joy for life. And I think it's such a good thing because I'm so, uh, I tend to be, I don't know, I'm not, I'm a very cautious optimist. I, I tend not to be as, as, um, uh, I don't know. I, I think well, maybe, Justin, that's why I'm broke because I'm just an optimist. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'll invest my money in this opportunity. And then I don't have it. And it doesn't come. <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 I, I totally understand. I mean, I, 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 you know, I just finished graduate school last year. 
Uh, you know, I'm in my first real sort of job in my field and congrats. Thank you so much. And, but the problem is it's not a permanent gig. So I have to figure out what I'm going to do in about a year and a half and, and, uh, you know, whether or not that's going to be a thing. I mean, I have a lot of really cool things coming up. I mean, I guess just to kind of cap off the episode here. Yeah. What are you um, excited about for 2018? Well, I'm pretty excited about a lot of things. So reason revolution has really grown in ways that I didn't in anticipate originally and I'm very excited about it. I have a whole bunch of guests that I'm so excited about coming on the show. Next week I'm going to be speaking with um, a very cool YouTuber who is I would say in a lot of ways is almost the exact opposite of you. Oh, um, nice. uh, so he's like, he's, nice. he's, 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 he is not like you and me. He's very much a firebrand. He identifies as an anti-theist. He's a, oh. he's a, he's a pretty badass dude. He's a guy named Reese, a guy named Reese. He runs a channel called nightmare fuel, uh, on YouTube. And he talks about atheism and politics and all kinds of stuff. And he's a super, super interesting guy. I cannot wait to sit down and talk and with we him. we need guys like Reese, man. Mm -hmm. Like, we need, yeah. we need those in your face because then, <laughs> we, because then we can come along and be like, okay, that guy's kind of crazy. Come on. Talk, talk to us. Like, we, we, need those, we need those in your face, like, anti, like, ah, oh, yeah. I want to get the message out. Like they have a place, you know? I mean, they're, well, you know, and I will say, you know, unlike Dave Rubin, I genuinely actually want to cultivate a show with a bunch of different opinions um, because yeah. he started a show that tried to do that. And it didn't kind of really happen. So I'm very excited about the guests I'm going to be having on. I'm really excited about a lot of the new developments. There's going to be, um, I, I, again, not like you, I can't really go into details just yeah. yet. We're sort of in the planning stages strategically, but Tyler, my collaborator and partner on this venture with me, we're working out some really cool stuff for this year. Um, Good. Uh, uh, I'll be up in Chicago next month seeing Sam Harris and Lawrence Krauss and Matt Dillahunty. That's going to be a blast. I'm excited about that. I'm going to be all over the place this year doing speaking engagements, which will be podcast episodes for our listeners. Um, what else has been going on? My gosh. Uh, my goodness. Um, uh, I'm pretty excited about the prospect of the Democrats getting back Congress. <laughs> I'm really hopeful oh, dude, that that's too. the case. Totally. Um, and I'm just really, I'm really excited about the prospect of um, finding a way to sort of uh, make this project that I'm working on, you know, that you've been so gracious with your time tonight um, in, in sort of finding ways to possibly make a little money off of it. Cause I just do this as a, as a, as a, as a as a hobby and it's a it's a very big project of mine you and me um, both my friend but uh and and i didn't i didn't i, I wasn't going to say it at first but fuck it i'll say it and say it. I, so i'm also really excited about um that i'm going to have a chapter in a book so nice congratulations <laughs> man it's like one of my dreams is to be smart enough to put pen to paper and have somebody buy it you are certainly you are certainly <laughs> smart enough to put something together. I I think your I think your story is certainly compelling. I think you would write a terrific memoir. Well, thank um, you. Thank uh, you. But but uh, so uh, for those who've listened to either my past shows or whatever, they know I'm a, I'm a I'm sort of an expert on the late 19th century free thought orator Robert Ingersoll. I'm writing a chapter about him and his sort of intellectual clashes with the evangelical preacher Dwight Moody in the late 19th century. Um, and that is the Moody of the movie Bible Institute. Yeah. Um, and so I'm writing a chapter on those two guys and their sort of intellectual sparring in the late 19th is century. Is there possible once you're done with that to get like an eyes only like manuscript copy that I can go over that and be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. You can certainly look at it. It's going to be yeah, in a book. Bible. It's going to be in a book um, that's going to be published by uh, NYU Press. It's going to be called Mapping Midwestern Minds. It's a collection of essays on Midwestern intellectual history. So that's what oh, that I sounds, do. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm a, I guess by trade. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Um, uh, by trade, I am an intellectual historian. I studied history of ideas and sort of how they influence people. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. I'll be in Grand Rapids in June giving a talk that's going to be based on that chapter for the Midwestern History Conference. Uh, I've submitted an abstract. I'll know whether or not I'm accepted yet. I imagine I will be. Um, so I'm going to be doing a bunch of speaking engagements. I'm going to be in March. I'll be at the Tri-State Freethinkers uh, talking on the history of American secularism that'll be hopefully recorded for the podcast uh i think in april i'm going to be at the unitarian universalist church here in indianapolis giving a talk i'm not sure if i'm going to do the history of american secularism yet or i'm going to do a talk on secular humanism 
Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, there's going to be a bunch of stuff coming down the pike, a bunch Man, of guests. Look at that. That's stuff. awesome. Thank you, brother. I, I really appreciate it. I, 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 um, I, it, it's, I like keeping busy. Uh, I, yeah. enjoy, I enjoy because uh, for me, when I get less busy, I get kind of sad. So yeah. I, I, I enjoy keeping busy. So let's, let's end talking a little bit more about you. So go ahead and plug your stuff. What, where can people find your, your podcast? Where can people find your, find your, um, your content? Well, Mar, our, uh, the podcast is pretty much on every, uh, on every podcast platform you can imagine. I think we're on, we're on iHeartRadio, we're on iTunes, we're on virtually all Android platforms. I'm on SoundCloud right now, but because I'm hosting through, this is totally unimportant. I'm on SoundCloud right now. And, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to stay upload currently because SoundCloud limits things and I'm already paying for hosting and I don't know if I can afford to do SoundCloud, but pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts, just type your atheist pastor and it'll show up. Um, we're very active on Instagram at your atheist pastor. Um, and the reason I didn't say the atheist pastor is because I'm not the definitive atheist pastor. I have this odd dream of multiple atheist pastors, dude, people, <laughs> like, here's the thing, people that went to school who, to be pastors and then all of a sudden like, don't have a job because we don't believe in God anymore. We pretty much have two options, sales or like, um, uh, I don't know, like sales or therapist. I mean, that's kind of the only two options you have. Um, and you know, I don't want, you know, selling insurance or, you know, going to school again to become a therapist. Like a lot of us don't have a chance to do that. So I had this odd dream of one day having an atheist pastor network where there are just people out there who are like, I don't know, pouring into each other's lives and giving people more counseling, you know, that they don't have to pay millions of dollars for. But um, yeah, your atheist pastor on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, but I'm not active on it at all yet. We have a atheist pastor Facebook group too, but we're really trying to focus on building the community and and, and like literally having a place for people to belong. I mean, and if that's something that you care about, if it's something that you want, if you feel like you don't have a place or you feel like you just want um, some place you belong, like join the group, you know I mean? Join the community and, and hang out, listen to the show, send us an email. We have a voicemail box now because we want to hear people call in. So um, 888-534-0061, I think is what our number is. I don't know. It's on our, uh, <laughs> it's, it's on, it's on our Instagram page. So don't quote me on the, yeah, 888-534-0061. People can call and leave messages. It's hysterical. Uh, we're going to do like a sound off segment where we take those voicemails and play them through. Um, but we're just really trying to connect with people. And if you want to connect your atheist pastor, that's where it's at. That's and, uh, oh, you can go to the the website. The website is going to be revamped soon. Uh, your atheist org is the website. And right now it's my personal website, but we're making this kind of whole shift for the, your atheist brand that we're not quite you know, I'm in the process of updating it. It's one of the things I need to do on the list. Um, but that'll be uh, more focused on the community based things. So yeah, we're really, we're really all about love, belonging and connection. I mean, that's what it's about. That's where we want to go. We want a secular community where people feel like they belong. And, uh, and if we can achieve that with just one or two people, uh, it really is worth it. So, um, that's kind of what we want to do. That's wonderful. Um, Luke, thanks again for being so gracious with your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. I have thoroughly enjoyed spending time and talking with you. And uh, thanks again, seriously. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. You're very, very welcome. Um, hang on the line there because uh, I'll do my little plugs now, I guess. Cool. Yep. Um, so, um, so that's it for this week of Reason Revolution. You can follow us on Instagram, uh, tw uh, um, my personal Instagram, The Daily Clark. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and all that good stuff, The Daily Clark. You can follow us on Twitter. We do have our own Twitter now, Reason. Uh, Reason Rev Pod at Reason Rev Pod, and you can keep up there. Um, also, check out our Facebook page. We're nearly to 800 likes on Facebook. We're getting so close. Um, Facebook.com slash Reason Revolution. That's where I post all the episodes uh, and I post all of our memes there and everything like that. Please give that a ch uh, check that out. Our website is brand newly revamped. My buddy Tyler did a whole new revamp of the whole website, um, ReasonRevolution.org. Um, you can find all podcast episodes, all the blogs. 
blogs, all the content is all there, reasonrevolution.org. Um, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, and all that good stuff. And I also wanted to do a very special shout out to Joshua Jackson, who is the first winner of our book away, uh, of our book giveaway, of our monthly book giveaway. He He's going to receive a free hardcover copy of God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. And every month we're going to be doing a free book giveaway for listeners. And so keep your eyes peeled on the Facebook and on our website because we're going to be doing another one for January. I haven't picked the book yet. Tyler and I are going to pick the book probably next week. Um, but we're going to be doing a, uh, another book giveaway soon. So again, congratulations to you, Joshua, for getting that book. That's very, very cool. Tyler will be mailing that out to you. And until next week, this has been Justin Clark. And this has been Reason Revolution. Revolution.